participation will always be voluntary. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Um, are there any citizens' comments this evening? <coughs> Seeing none, we will move on to the presentation from the Florence Sawyer School. So, uh, Mr. Bates, are you going to introduce? Sure, and I'd be happy kick to. It off? And thank you so much for, for having us here tonight. I am thrilled to uh, give you folks, by virtue of our coordinators, a little bit of information about a tremendous addition to the Florence Sawyer School. It's called Girls on the Run, and I will turn it over to uh, Lauren and Kelsey and Jen to explain uh, the program. And we'll have you come to the front, please. And if you could introduce yourselves, uh, thank you, uh, Principal Bates, and tell us what role you play in the school. Uh, that would be terrific. And I know some of you are kind of new to us, so we'd love to hear, love for you to tell us. And feel free to sit down. You, you don't have to stand. You, you're welcome to sit if you'd like. Thank you. So we'll pass around a couple of flyers before we get started, just some informational pieces. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, so I'm Lauren Zaviet. I'm one of the school counselors at Florence Sawyer. I work with students in grades four through eight. I'm Kelsey Bassardet. I work within our therapeutic program as a school adjustment counselor slash school social worker with our, um, it's our early um, elementary school. Okay. And I'm Jennifer Hubeck, and I'm a first grade teacher. Um, we're really excited to share with you tonight about Girls on the Run. Um, we have a couple of slides to share. I'm not going to read through all of the details on the slide because I know you can all see that. Um, really, we want to share with you what the program um, means to us and the impact we have on our parents in our school. Um, the technology, okay. <laughs> um, so Girls on the Run is a national nonprofit organization actually expanding international. Um, it's a 10-week program. Students attend 20 sessions that culminate in a celebratory 5K at the end of the program. It's open to all girls, grades 3 through 5. Um, we joke that it's essentially a social-emotional learning curriculum um, disguised as a 5K training program. Okay. So it's a really nice way to merge social-emotional learning and that curriculum that's so, so important for students, especially at those ages, um, with getting them physical exercise and getting them really engaged and involved in the program. Um, and a nice way for them to feel a real concrete accomplishment at the end of it. Um, not only can they learn <coughs> the skills that they've developed, but they have a really tangible um, set of goals that each week they're building up the laps that they're doing, and at the end they get to celebrate with family and peers at the 5K. Absolutely. Um, and just a little bit of history about how Girls on the Run um, came to us. It was an organization that I think we all kind of knew about. Um, we didn't necessarily know how to bring it to our own district. Um, and it turns out they're very accessible and they're super supportive about having girls on the run in the schools. And um, we were really grateful because we had the response from the community that we were hoping for. I think at first we were a little nervous because you need a certain amount of students to be able to um, go forward with your program. However, we ended up with actually over the number that we were anticipating or could even allow. So it really worked out. And we do have still an expressed interest from other families for the future seasons, hopefully, you know, other people that would like to participate. Um, so it's been great, you know, to kind of work really together. Start. Yeah, absolutely. This, um, it was a program yeah. I had actually heard yeah. about years back working in a previous district and had been wanting for years to, to become a part of. Um, when I moved back to the Central Massachusetts District, we're really lucky that while it's a national organization, the Worcester County chap chapter um, is very active and accessible. Um, <coughs> my family got involved through the Worcester County Board. Um, and after volunteering at a couple of 5Ks and talking to staff members and moving to Bolton, felt like this is so great that I'm at a school that supports this. We talked to Joel and had his support. Yeah. Um, and it's been really exciting to see it brought to life this year. Mm -hmm. um, so while the mission and vision up behind you are the national organization's mission and vision, um, those really do kind of tie in with what we wanted to bring to Sawyer, yeah. um, along with the district goal of incorporating social emotional learning. I think it's something that the three of us talk about all of the time, like how can we possibly find more time during the day to get every possible opportunity in for students. We hear so much um, need from students, as we know, they're all mm -hmm. individuals developing and they face so many different challenges that rather than come at 
um, social emotional challenges from a intervention perspective. We really wanted to build up skills um, and give them some preventable skills, which is what I feel Girls on the Run has been doing for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so essentially, you know, the mission for Girls on the Run is to empower young girls and young women um, to make positive decisions, to have control over the decisions that they're making. Um, and, and using that, you know, very specific empowerment piece, you know, for the physical, for the physical connection, for the mind, you know, the whole mind, body, soul connection. Um, so we've seen a really great um, impact for the girls, especially in terms of connecting and building positive and safe relationships with our coaches and with the other kiddos on our team. Um, I think a lot of the girls who came to us were seeking out that um, connectedness. And it can be a component that's missing for a lot of kids, how to make friends, how to keep friends, um, how to deal with uncomfortable emotions and things like that. And then also, you know, how to be healthy and, you know, phys physical. And um, we, you know, hear girls a lot of times who are like, I, you know, not only did I resolve this conflict with a friend appropriately, but I also exceeded my lap goal that I wanted to accomplish for the for the week. So they're just seeing success for themselves and it it is a pocket of students that might not see that success in other areas as easily or like a tangible success. So it's really nice for the girls to be able to come together and have almost like a common goal that they know they want to work on with that social emotional need and then also like the physical goal of completing a 5k is you know something tangible that you can work towards. So it's been really great. So these are some of the core values that we work towards, um, you know, like I said, building that mind, body, soul connection, um, definitely building the connections with the staff, um, and, you know, assuming positive intent is something that I think shifted my thinking. You know, we, we talk a lot about addressing negative thoughts, um, and that's a really challenging concept, and, you know, it's hard to not ruminate in those negative thoughts, and so we do a ton of processing with our girls, and sometimes that can kind of overshadow the running component at times. However, um, you know, and we'll go through in a little, but um, the girls definitely feel like it's a safe opportunity for them to talk about issues and things that they're experiencing as they're moving through their week, because we get to see them twice a week, which is really special that we can see them so frequently. Yeah. And then this is just a little model that um, Girls on the Run shares, that, you know, just to kind of show like the flow and the um, emphasis of what they put on carrying confidence, confidence, character, and connection. Um, and then while also marrying that with the contribution. So something that the girls also are working towards um, because, you know, right now, definitely the work that they're doing is um, on themselves and their skills. And now we're kind of start going to focus on the community contribution. So something we can do to also give back to the community as well. That is totally girl driven and will be yes. happening in our next couple of lessons. So we can report back on what they are trying to do to help the community. Yeah, absolutely. So a, a practice, this is what a practice with girls on the run might look like. Like I said, I won't go through everything, but um, you know, we do like a snack in a processing time where we look back on each week has a theme. So it might be making connections or making friends, um, dealing with emotions, things like that. Um, so we will look at a concept that happened in a previous week and we'll ask the girls, how did that concept work for you this week? You know, what, did, what worked for you? What didn't work for you? What are we still working on? Um, or what would you like more of? And so we spend a lot of time on that processing piece and the girls really are very willing to share and I think it's fostered a really safe environment for girls to be able to share. And um, the, the girls are very um, understanding with each other and offer a lot of great feedback. So the idea is that we can kind of take a step back so that they can be allowed to share and process with each other and support each other um, and sort of like problem solve independently. So it's been cool. Um, and then we also tie in um, our workouts, of course, so eventually we have to get to the running part, um, which you know we try to marry also with the concept that we're promoting for that week. So last week it was um, communication, and we went through you know some of those I feel, I need statements. And so the girls had to do like a running drill, and it said you know I feel, and they you know then they had to do another lap and then the other girls had to say what you know when you and then um what's the next because, because and then I would like for you too and it was really hard so it was even hard for me to remember sometimes and so we did it so often that it became very routine to the girls and then as I saw them throughout the week 
they were, I witnessed them using those concepts with other peers when they needed it. Um, so it was nice to see that translating into the school day and they were resolving, you know, some things that were coming up for them independently, whereas before they might need, have needed, you know, some staff support, they were more independent with that process. Which is great. Yeah. 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 <coughs> um, so speaking of the girls' responses, that's really what we want to share with you tonight. Um, the One of the handouts that we passed around was a research study that was done by an independent group um, in 2000, so I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I think 2016. Um, so that gives us a lot of really strong backing statistics to support why it matters, but I think everyone in this room probably already knows why it matters for students at this age. It's really the, the level of confidence, um, the rapid rate at which we see it dropping for students without some social emotional intervention is concerning and the, the research um, really supported that having an intervention like Girls in the Run makes a significant difference. Um, but what we wanted to share, I'm going to pass around a few of these um, just so you can take a little look at what the girls have to say themselves about what it means to them. Um, the research is one thing, but seeing it in action from the girls is a whole other thing. Um, we know we had some students who would have loved to be here tonight, but they are third through fifth graders who are so scheduled. They are so, yeah. so busy after school. Um, so we wanted to bring their work to you, and they were comfortable with us sharing these. Um, we've seen one, one that um, I'll hang on to because it may need a little uh, spelling translation, but we have one girl who um, she was comfortable with us sharing. Yeah. She has struggled with peers, has a, a harder time than most connecting with others, um, and seeing the value in herself. And one of our early lessons was about negative self-talk and changing that to more positive self-talk. And as they completed every couple of laps, girls paused to write down um, some positive traits that they knew about themselves so that if negative self-talk starts to come in, they're already armed with some phrases that they know about themselves that they can come back to. And she was stuck. Um, couldn't come up with anything, watched her start to write nothing. And before coaches even had a chance to intervene, some of the girls in the grade above her stopped in and said, what are you talking about? You're awesome. I remember in circle you shared this and you gave that example. Let's do a laugh. And then she came back, crossed out nothing, and I know it sounds like the most cheesy thing, but wrote verbatim, I'm awesome. And it was so nice to hear that hearing that from her peers, running with them, being involved has made a difference. Um, so when she was asked what Girls in the Run means to you, um, she wrote feeling safe, to feel safe with others. Um, and that's been great. At our last, in our last processing, she was the first one to raise her hand and immediately say, I feel when you, because I, I would like for you to. Like she had been practicing it all week. Um, so we've seen some really tangible outcomes from the girls, which is great. Absolutely. And I think, you know, thinking back to, you know, we've been in their shoes before, and I think these are those fundamental years where we do want to start, you know, if a student is lacking in that self-esteem, we want to start building that. We want to be building the connections. Um, and for them to be able to have a safe environment and safe relationships to, to look back on, you know, it's hugely important. And, you know, we've been so grateful because we have our administrative um, support which has been awesome um, and especially with you know building that confidence and in, in that you know female empowerment um, and it's yeah so it's you know it's it's been awesome to have the girls you know, expressing what they need how they feel and um, yeah they're doing a great job with it um, and, and full staff support as well yes. we do have um, we're close to the end of our time but we do have the 5k coming up um, mid-november um, and it's been really great to see not only the coaching staff and our administration, but all of the teachers get involved. Um, we keep having more and more staff check in. How's Girls in the Run going? Oh, I saw you guys outside. Yeah. I heard a little of your circle. Um, and we're inviting all staff members if they're interested in joining the 5K. Every girl that runs it runs with a running buddy, so they have to have an adult with them as they complete the 5K. Um, it is mostly running, a little bit of skipping and hopping and walking along the way as well. Um, so some of our staff members are joining as running buddies for girls that aren't yeah. a family member. Um, and of course, we, we handed out the fire as well. Anyone of you is more than welcome to come join, um, even if you'd like to just come check it out and see what all the, the hub is about. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Questions? Yeah. Comments? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just have a quick question oh, about, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mike. Um, the, 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 the curriculum that you deliver, does that come from um, something established or is that just something yes. that you collaborate in? 
It is. So the Girls on the Run National Organization puts out the curriculum, um, and then we all attended a training to go through the curriculum, um, to become trained on all the components of it and practice with each other. They actually offer three different versions of the curriculum so that we can continue season after season and the girls can come back if they would like to. Um, and it starts in August? We start August? the second week, the second full week in September. Okay. So. Great. Yes. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. It's a really good experience. Leah. I wonder if there's a, com um, a companion boys on the run. One so of my we have gotten that yeah. feedback. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> We've talked about that. Yeah, with we the, have. The head of the Worcester chapter. Right now, there are provisions in the group for boys who would like to participate, can work with the chapter and their local sites to participate. But right now, there isn't a full companion, mm -hmm. um, which would be a wonderful thing to right. see. It would be. Leah? I also wonder if um, you guys plan to share out with the other schools you would like in the district. Yeah, yeah. We definitely. I would love to collaborate, so yeah. we can think about that for sure. With it being our first season, we were like fingers crossed. Let's, yeah. let's get this off the yeah. ground. And so far, it has all been. Um, so I like hate to be so overly cheesy, but it has yeah. been such a great experience yeah. so far. It so has. I really can't wait to share it with others and see if we can get other schools involved too. Mary, so is this out the school? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay, so you volunteer your time or? Is it, it is, all the coaches, anyone that um, coaches Girls on the Run has to be on a volunteer basis. So it's yeah. all volunteer. So I'd like to thank you for volunteering thank your you so time. Much. This is such thank an you. exciting yeah. program and the yeah. girls need this so much at this age. Yeah. And the fact that you're doing that with your expertise um, mm -hmm. makes it that much more important and meaningful. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate that. And thank I think, you. you know, your support, our administration support, it's all been, you know, really helpful in getting, you know, girls on the run off the ground. And, um, you know, I think I was talking to Joel the other day and just kind of processing about the program. And I was like, you know, it's um, these girls come to us with really great skills. They have some really great skills. And, and we're just trying to bolster those connections and, and Joel kind of reminded me like, you know, you're making a difference in, in a pocket of girls, you know, and, and that's really important. So, you know, I think it, as big or small as we can do, you know, it's, it's, it goes both ways. So we're, we're happy to be doing it. Yeah. Joel, thank you. Um, not Joel. I mean, Todd. Yeah, no, thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to chime in and say that my daughter participated in this program. Oh, She's 13 awesome. now, eighth grade going into ninth grade. Oh. and. Um, the results that it had in her confidence level alone and awesome. the connection she made with the teacher, the advisor yeah. who was involved in that and she did it in upper elementary into going into middle school mm -hmm. and just the tremendous impact that on her. So I'm wearing my dad hat right now. Yeah. So, awesome. um, thank you for mm -hmm. um, the work and the presentation because it's a great program, especially for yeah, so great that you know. girls yeah. who need that. Uh, how many girls are involved this year? 16. 16. 16. Yeah. They, usually um, cap it at 15, they usually cap it at 15, but they let us take 16 because <laughs> we were pushing the wait list. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, so I noticed on the um, the sheet on the, the run that there's a um, uh, fees that have to be paid to participate. Yeah. How are those covered? So any of the, the girls that are registered for the program, they don't pay to register for the 5K. So those are for anyone in the community that wants to participate. Cool. Um, there is a fee for the program, but the scholarship program through Girls in the Run is really strong. So anyone that was interested um, and isn't able to afford the program fee talks directly with the chapter, um, with the local council, and they yeah. do scholarships. No, I would agree, and I love the way it brings in, you know, the, the social emotional learning is one of our big themes yeah. for the year. And it's it's easy to think about it as a something linear that's that's a curriculum, <coughs> but when it is integrated the way that it is in the program, it it's, it reinforces it, and kids start to see the connection. So thank you, and thank you for volunteering to do it. Thank you for having us. And I just want to say too, I love your energy. Oh my goodness, you just feel it, and, and I love the enthusiasm that you you're bringing to this. Um, <laughs> I, I just think it's amazing. I, I would agree with absolutely everything that Kathy said too. I'm so grateful and, and Mary, uh, thank you for your efforts with this. And for the first year to be at 16 is I know. fabulous, fabulous. <laughs> We've had some great. great success stories that um, we, there's a student who typically acts out under you know frustration or, or will shut down. And the other day she was able to just talk to Kelsey and say, I was feeling you know, this way, could you not, could you please not do that again? Yeah. Instead of just acting out or, you know, you're shutting down. It's huge. Yeah. Which oh, how wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Thank you. Today. We really Thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for it.
That's exciting. Very exciting. Um, I just have a, a, a couple of things. Um, just that the next uh, regular school committee school committee meeting will be on November 20th, and um, uh, members of the school committee will be attending the MASC MASS conference in Hyannis, which runs from um, November 6th through the 8th or 9th. Um, most people stay a, a day or two. So, um, who all from the committee is? Joseph's going, Mary's going, I'm going, and then Brooke and Todd mm -hmm. are going. So um, we will, the people attending will bring back uh, reports about the things that uh, we attended uh, that we thought um, would be important for us to share. And so um, in the future, if folks can even just go down for a day, it's, mm -hmm. it's well worth it. And um, you can always look at the um, programs that they send out to see where you want to target your time. So. I'm looking forward to it. Um, okay, um, uh, the student representative report. Mr. 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 DeMonico, who is our yep, student council I'm a, representative. I'm a high school senior. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, I, I think right now, let's see, it's 20 past six. I think Ibby is probably warming up with the rest of the, uh, the student uh, band as they perform their fall concert tonight. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm stepping in and pinch hitting for her. Um, a lot of music on the uh, on the report this week. Um, there's the band concert tonight at seven. Choir concert is mm -hmm. next Wednesday. Uh, last weekend, the high school band invited seventh and eighth grade musicians to play the football game, and they sounded great. Uh, and by all accounts, the kids had a lot of fun. So that's a nice way of growing the music program uh, as kids get ready to come up to the high school. Uh, at Hale, the music department will be running a poinsettia sale as a fundraiser in the, uh, in the month of November. And the Stowe Friends of Music hosts a winter dance for middle schoolers. Also in Stowe at the Center School, Ms. Dyer is teaching cooperation and teamwork <coughs> to students through a world music drumming <coughs> unit. Students are discovering how to listen to each other and work together to achieve a goal. At Luther Burbank, the other end of the district, their brand new first ever honors ensemble had its first rehearsal this week. This is an auditioned extracurricular ensemble for instrumental students interested in playing more challenging music. Uh, and at the high school, let's see, uh, as far as uh, sports is concerned, the fall season is coming to an end. Uh, that means uh, many senior nights. So field hockey is this Thursday, volleyball on Friday, girls soccer Saturday, boys Monday, and uh, there's a football game at home on Friday. So there will be senior nights for for all of the athletes on those, uh, at those games. Uh, the end of the quarter is just two weeks away, end of the first quarter. Uh, the high school is encouraging more student involvement uh, by hosting student voice and engagement sessions. We had the first one a couple weeks ago and the next session is, is uh, next Thursday the 30th, or next Wednesday the 30th after school. That is a Wednesday, October 30th. And, uh, we're, uh, we're bribing kids by encouraging them to come and we'll feed them pizza. So mm -hmm. that's, the, uh, that's the hook to get them in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and homecoming is this Saturday. <coughs> so that's, that's the news from Lake Wogledon. Okay. <laughs> Just a question, the student engagement day, yep. will you talk a little bit more about what that is? I will, yeah, I will. Uh, it's, as you know, we have PLTs uh, at, at the school, professional learning teams, and uh, I'm working with three teachers, Maureen Dumay, uh, Matt Biggs, both are biology teachers, and Tim Kastner, who's a history, history teacher. <coughs> and uh, we're designing conversations, formats for conversations, uh, to have kids come in to talk about what's on their mind um, as they think about school and to share, and to, you know, as, as the phrase is, lean in and, and be a part of, of what's going on and be a part of. Um, uh, raising questions, discovering <coughs> answers, and making the kind of change that they want to see. So, um, at our first session, we had uh, we had about uh, close to ten kids, uh, and we're hoping we're hoping next week to uh, to double that. So, so if, do I understand that you're, you're um, creating protocols, something? You know, yep. Okay. Yep. At, at like, our last like meeting. critical <coughs> friends type of. Well, not you know that's the adult level. Yeah. Uh, but if you if you had some protocols with those essential questions um, that could be useful, that yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 
um, you know, how to have those kinds of conversations mm -hmm. and, and how to uh, disagree agreeably mm -hmm. with someone uh, and, and come to at least understand somebody else's point of view. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Leah? I actually just sat in on Mary Murata's uh, workshop today at MassQ and she outlined something that is fascinating to me with regard to student voice and it's basically rooted in design thinking mm -hmm. of problem solving and the protocol that she showed us today seems like it would be great for a student engagement day. So perhaps... Yep. Yep, I've certainly talked to Mary. Her, uh, she's my neighbor, so to speak, at, at the school. <laughs> oh, so, right next to mine. so we talk. Office. We talk yeah. often. Yeah. And I only say that because I run a student government or organization in my high school, and I thought to myself as she was sharing it, and she was sharing a science lesson or whatever, um, I thought this is perfect for student government. It so. is that whole design thinking process. Yeah, yeah. that was great. So um, we had talked. We had spoken earlier when we were talking about PLTs about, I think uh, last year and the year before, there was a report out at some mm -hmm. point in the year. So um, it would be great to, when we, when we have that, to hear what some of the outcomes are. I mean, what was the, what did you start out with and then mm -hmm. what, um, um, you know, what, what came out of it. But also, um, I think we'd be really interested in hearing from kids who worked with you. Hopefully some will stick with it. Do they have they don't have to sign up for the duration. <coughs> no, that's a great point. Up. That's a great no, but, um, but several it, of them are. Yes. Yeah. So to, to hear from them and, and um, how they perceive the process and if they see any anything different. But um, but I'm glad it's being so instead of sleeping in, these kids have to show up for the, the PLT. Is that when you Yeah, that was the the first one of course was on a late start day. So oh, yes. rather than sleep in they came okay. we're hoping on the thirtieth, which is an early release day, okay. we're more likely to hold on to kids. They've got to stay for other activities. Sure. Um, and once they're in the building, they might as well stick around for free pizza <laughs> and, and be part of the conversation. So <laughs> just put that okay. plug in there. That's right. <laughs> Yes, Mary. I need to ask whether this would be an appropriate time to talk to uh, Principal Dean Domenico about the student representative. Uh, or do we want to no. wait for the policy? Let's wait. Please. Okay. All right. All right. Even though the last meeting. Yes, I understand. I understand that okay. uh, we're seeing a pattern and um, we're no, no, talking no. about it. But it's uh, okay. But I mean, I couldn't talk about it before. Leah had brought up something and I couldn't talk about it. And I just wanted to ask Paul. One question. Oh, okay. No, okay. I'm going to ask both. So you had you had talked about the fact that it really wouldn't make sense to have a group of students and and rotating um, basis. But what I wanted to just ask whether if we had if you had an alternate. That's all I was. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I wanted to say last time. Yeah. If <clears throat> that might be something you could consider Absolutely. having an alternate, so it would be a, a student. We love to have Absolutely. you here because you know <laughs> you no, know so much. Like that's all. Yep. That's what yep. I wanted to say. Yep. Thank you. That makes that makes uh, perfect sense. Mm -hmm. That'll happen. Okay. Any other questions for Paul? All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, Mr. Yeah, absolutely. So, just to give you a, a bit of a, a some foreshadowing, even though I, I'm going to be speaking to these items, I have one that's not on here. So, I'm just to let you, that's like the anticipatory set, right? Remember from Madeline Hunter's time period, those educators? Yes, this is the anticipatory set. So, even though you think I'm done, I won't be. So, I have one item after. Um, so budget basically just so you know it's ongoing I just put it there to say yeah we, we're uh, regularly doing this um, I know that Todd's going to speak to this uh, through the T and L lens here in a few minutes um, but it, it's ongoing for us as we continue to have different meetings um, all the time with uh, with administrators with uh, different leaders of different departments um, with uh, some of the department chairs that, that we're involving so that work is ongoing, so uh, I just want to report it out to say, yeah, everything's preliminary, but it's critical to our thinking as we look to establish priorities for next year. And remember that I had said once before, very often, almost always in our budget process, we look ahead a year. We don't just look at the year, we always look pretty much at least one to two years ahead of the work that we're doing. And so that's why we, we do the amount of work that we do through our process. We never just look at, oh gee, let's, let's look at 2021 as a separate entity. It, it isn't. It's part of, you know, ongoing. So that works on, uh, continues. Um, a tri -tail, 
I had an idea and I suggested it to our um, town administrators. I know that it's Lancaster's turn to, to host um, a, a, the next Tri-Town meeting, um, but we it's been 18 months and, and so I, I really would like, and, and I think this makes sense, I would like to look at a different format. For example, so I'm putting this out here for perhaps a little bit of conversation as to whether, and, and some feedback if, if you think that this is okay. I've proposed that what I'd like to do is have the first Tri-Town meeting of the year hosted by us, hosted here by the school committee in, in Bolton, in this room. Um, and my thinking is, is that we have so much that happens in the summer that I'd really like to fill in our, our Board of Selectmen members who, who come to these at that early part of the year and say, this is what we've done through the summer, here's where we're at, here's the type of school start we've had. And it makes sense that we can also bring in some of our uh, leadership, for example, Rob Frieswick, I'm sure that they probably are going to want to know how did the Leachfield project go? Where are we at with the <coughs> oil tank? And talk to us about the still water. Talk to us about you know like, mm -hmm. and, and you know we we got this major <coughs> grant, an eighty thousand dollar grant. Well, that was only because we had our, our safety partners from our communities help us, working with Lisa and Rob to be successful with it. I would want them to know that, but it seems like I don't have any other place to to talk to them about that. So I thought I'd really like to see in, in a perfect world that we host the first one and then we can line up the others. And so that, you know, so I suggested some months, for example, I think Lancaster, uh, I want to say, has suggested um, December, I think, or January. January. And then, you know, Bolton the next, you know, and then the, and Stowe would be the last one like in May. And so I thought if we can set the dates up right now and just say look, we're, we're committed to four times but I also said, if there's no agenda, then we're comfortable with that, and then we won't have that meeting, and I'm fine with that. But let's 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 start, because I think they're important. I think it's important to bring, as a regional school district, our three communities, boards of selectmen together, at least a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. So I, I put that out there. I, I got really positive response from the um, town administrator saying, that sounds great, that makes total sense. Let's do that. I, I told them all that I would be bringing it forward to you tonight for some feedback from you. But I just think it's really important for a couple times a year to try to get everybody together. Mm -hmm. So I open it up for any thoughts you might have on that. May I? Mm, I think it makes tremendous sense. And uh, last the week before last, um, when I accompanied you, we went to the Board of Selectmen mm -hmm. in Bolton, uh, where I was able to see um, the productive relationship that you have established with them and how open they were and how interested they were and how much Brooke had to talk about even at that point, you know, from the summer and from the opening of school. And so um, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense to start off and have the three towns together and yeah. have the boards. So I'm in favor of it. Great, thank you. <coughs> Steve. Well, you know, I've been, I've been complaining that we haven't had one in a long time. Yeah. And I think it's important for us to have this interaction with the boards of selectmen, I only caution that we want to make it so that they come. So I don't know if you're going to have food like you did the first the time we aren't. Yes, that's all right. I even put that in the email. I promise that we will have Tom who will prepare some snacks for us. So because he did, they did a great those, job last those, time. Those, those who who heard about it and didn't show up were they they, they were, were so right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so no, we'll we'll have our food services to do that as well. Yeah. But there's nothing that could, we, we can't force it. And and even too, and I I know that Kathy would probably say this after, but. Not everybody here needs to show up either. It's not it's not a mandatory thing, right? It, but it's really it's really more about dissemination of information and collegiality and, and a partnership. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that I think Tritown strengthens that. Mm -hmm. No, I would agree. I mean if folks <coughs> want to come and can be here, that's great. But it is in the evening, there are other things that, that go on. Um, and um, it's you know you're, you're welcome to come, but it's it's not mandatory by any means. So, ma'am, have you proposed a date? Uh, we we're, we're just playing with dates right now. To okay. be honest with you, we should we should have that wrapped up probably in the next within the next week. I would guess okay. that we'll have some dates. We're hoping. Joseph. 
as civic-minded as I like to think I am, I'm embarrassed to say that I've never attended a Tri-Town meeting. So perhaps mm -hmm. you might elucidate as to how the format of the meeting is established. I'd be happy to. Thank yeah. you. I, you know, I, sometimes I for, forget that. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. So really, the, the, the um, it is considered a formal meeting, so there has to be appropriate postings done and that kind of thing. So that's why one of the reasons why we want to get the dates up now, because the last time we tried this, which was a couple of weeks ago, the t postings got a, a little skewed, and so we weren't able to have the meeting because of that. Um, so my, again, it's, it's a regular meeting. Everybody's invited. So the our board here is invited, our school committee is invited, and each of the board of selectmen is invited from each of the three communities. And they're pretty good about attending, to be honest with you. And um, so we'll all sit around, a, like this table will be enlarged and, and we'll all be around here. They're generally televised, so like any meetings. Um, generally, they we set, we set an agenda ahead of time of different things that they're looking at that they'd like to have maybe an update on or um, some discussion on, uh, you know. Sometimes it's our school committee that has brought it to the towns. For example, like one year, it was about the culvert on Wilder Road. I remember that some of the school, because we were worried about our buses driving over that particular culvert in the, in the state that it was in, you know. So sometimes you get topics like that. Um, I think particularly for budget season, it's really good because you, you have a chance to kind of lay, lay some things out. Um, you know, I often, wonder though I don't think that this was a case necessarily but if, for example Lancaster might have had a greater heads up about you know the uh, where we were heading for example with regards to the oil tank and the you know the uh, leach field in a different in a different form if we would had that tri town meeting because they would have heard about it a couple of times before it ever went to where it went you know in terms of the town and, and the, uh, the, the town meeting so I think it serves a lot of purposes um, generally, the, um, Mr. Wrigley uh, generally doesn't attend, but certainly Orlando attends, uh, Don Lowe generally attends. Um, so it's a really good forum, just again, just for the sake of uh, collegiality, having the snacks and the food and visiting and that kind of thing, but also dealing with the business too and getting caught up in what their school <coughs> district is doing. So, and I think because we work so well together, especially with our safety partners, that there's so much to discuss, there's so much to lay out and let our communities know about. So I think for so many reasons, it's, a, it's just a great evening. Can, can yes. I just follow up with that? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. If we post it, as far as the format is concerned, who would chair the meeting? Would you chair the meeting as far as... Uh, Actually, it's generally chaired by the... Um, who, in, the when we go to the... Com yeah, when we go to the communities, the host community is generally... So for example, if it was... Um, Let's say, for example, if it was in Lancaster, then it would be the Board of Selectmen chair that would host that particular meeting. When it goes to Bolton, it's generally that chair that hosts it. Here, it would it would be Kathy. Okay. Yeah. Other, questions? Other questions? That was great. Thank you for doing that. I don't think sometimes to <laughs> flush those things out. Okay. Are you on it? Great. I'm good. I'm sorry. Uh, Bolton Board of Selectmen meeting. I, I right uh, as Mary said. I thought that that was fabulous. I I, I really appreciated having you there that night. Um, I have also sent out to both Lancaster and um, Stowe that we'd love to attend and then if, if we're taking up on that, you know, we welcome you to come and join us at that. It, it, it is, again, it's about relationship building and partnering with your communities and, and having your communities be able to ask firsthand questions. Like they asked some really good questions the other night. Um, I, I find that every time I go to those groups, they do, they have great questions. If I don't have the answers, I always get back to them. Like that night, they had a couple questions I was able to text people and get the answers to them within probably about an hour after I got home. You know, but it, it's first-hand information and it's just really a great opportunity. So special thanks to the Bolton Board of Selectmen for inviting us and Mary. Mm -hmm. Special thanks to you for attending. That was, it was fun. Was yeah. glad to Thank you. Uh, so we'll turn it over to Todd for the, the other items. Great. Uh, Leah already mentioned today was the mass, the annual Mass Q conference held at Gillette Stadium in Foxborough. Um, several of our Neshoba educators and our staff participated in this annual conference. It is the premier educational technology conference that is held uh, annually there, as well as uh, ongoing high quality 
professional development, professional learning opportunities, they have a lot of webinars, they have a lot of resources, workshops, camps, on-site learning opportunities. Uh, I was pleased to report that we had several from Neshoba actually participating and actually presenting, and you attended one mm -hmm. that you reported out on, so thank you for that. Um, and so it was a great opportunity for several of our district staff to attend this year, and they always bring back a tremendous amount of resources um, to our classrooms and to our district. So kudos to the teachers who presented and the faculty who went in our teaching and learning department for putting it all together today. So it's an amazing if you've <coughs> if you've never been if you can ever go. It's just it's an incredible experience. It just really is an incredible experience. Uh, so I'm I'm glad that you got the opportunity. You were you were able to go for the whole the whole thing today. The whole day, yeah. Yeah. Good. It was, it's just it's a fabulous experience. So that's great. <coughs> Um, next, next uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Before you move on, Todd, um, I wonder, uh, I'm not even totally sure how my district is doing this, so I wonder, how are you going to share the information? So you had a small cohort of people who, who were participants, mm -hmm. probably have so much in their head right now. How do you make sure that that information gets disseminated so that other educators who weren't able to go can still benefit from all of those resources? Yeah, I mean, I think through the teaching and learning department, we do so much PD and bring in groups. Um, so frequently that they that those are their opportunities to share same thing on the early release days you know when it's building based etc we tend to do that um, and I think the two groups that that presented today one was uh, one was, uh, Kim early and her work with literacy and a novel approach at the high school and interweaving that with with technology and how they do that and then you went to Mary Murata's around design thinking mm -hmm. that she is already sharing out through the high school with the professional learning teams so. I think we, we work really hard to capitalize on that yeah. take advantage of it and hopefully some of those groups will come here. Uh, and Principal D. Domenico already teed up the professional learning teams that I'm going to talk a little bit about. So he talked about his own professional learning team. So um, our high school's late start times are in full swing with really strong professional development opportunities that are being developed. Um, you mentioned the critical friends groups that once were. I used to be involved in critical friends group, and it reminds me a lot of that time that we that we spent together as as professionals. So really as a way to enhance the professional learning at the high school and the culture of the climate. Uh, multiple teams have been developed. I had the opportunity to um, spend some time with the Global Education and the Global Learning PLT and Greg Denson is here today to report out on some trips. Um, that was a great experience um, and being just one of them. Uh, there's one on literacy, there's one around design thinking. Principal Di Domenico spoke about his. Um, so through this work, each team is developing a purpose and a plan with a goal to improve the programming, the professional learning, and the culture within the high school this year. And we look forward to hopefully bringing some of that work to this this group by the end by the end of the year and some of their products that they're developing. So, and um, I know that Greg is going to speak to some of the field trips that they're presenting um, this year uh, and putting those together for the high school and putting together a, a, a global education plan. Um, that they're working on this year. So I had an opportunity to visit with them last week, which was a lot of fun. So some good work happening at the high school, for sure. And the next thing I know Brooke's going to talk about it as well, but in terms of um, visioning, you, you start to, you I start will start with in. our teaching and learning department. You know that um, we spoke a lot about some of the changes that have been going on in the teaching and learning department over the last couple of years and since I came on um, at the beginning of last year. Um, so we are... Um, really meeting regularly to talk as a team, but we're also meeting regularly, as you know, at least once a month with our district administrators and our principals. Um, and we're really um, looking at examining um, how uh, that department functions and some of the changes that have been going on there. You know, we brought in our uh, technology specialists last year. So we have two technology integration specialists that work with our director of digital learning. Uh, you know, we unrolled a digital literacy plan last year. Um, and you know, we also brought in Kim early this year as a humanities lead position in the work that she's doing um, with our humanities, really in the secondary, our middle school and our high school and the work that she's doing in that bridge kind of between the secondary schools and our district offices in teaching and learning. So um, as we continue to move forward and take a look at where the department is going, we certainly are taking a look at reimagining what the teaching and learning department looks like, what its purpose is um, and we continue to move in the area of innovation so as we move forward we want to we want to kind of throw out there that we do have some some changes and some some thoughts that we have moving forward on what that department continues to look like and what it will evolve into moving forward so and our hope is to bring our ITS specialists 
and Kim to you in December so that they can share mm -hmm. out the work that they've been doing, not only in the district offices with teaching and learning, but what they've been doing in classrooms with teachers and sharing out um, sharing out their work. So I know Brooke wants to talk a little bit about it as well. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited about it. And I, I said to Todd, this is our opportunity to kind of sit almost with a blank slate in front of us and say, what could, should this look like? Uh, we had, a, I thought, a fabulous meeting in here the other day around this table with uh, our administrative team as we just took a look and said, okay, what, what do we really need? What do your buildings, what do your staff, what do the teachers really need from this unit? And I, I think it's an opportunity for us to really kind of stand back and re, as you say, re-envision. Um, we've even talked about changing the name. I, I don't know whether that's where we're going to land or not, but we've had that kind of discussion and we're saying that what, what are our expectations again looking ahead uh, and being progressive in our thinking about education 10 years down the road, what, what do we need to get where we want to go and how do we get there and so you've, you've started a, a, a major <coughs> picture uh, escape in your your office right now and every time I go back in we add another thick piece here a piece there and as we think about it and, and whatnot so uh, we're excited about that and, and I, I said to Todd I really felt it was important that we we let you know that we're doing this right now because we see an opportunity on the horizon to make some shifts and our our question to ourselves now is what should those shifts be and so we'll probably come forward I think we're planning in December to lay out basically a skeletal piece of it before we go into the budget season, the, your budget part of the season in January and say this is what we're thinking. And again, we talked to you about uh, Greg and Gary and the work that they are, are, they are doing on uh, the, uh, the days that they're able to come in and Kim early and they're just doing phenomenal work. And I'd love for you to see what type of work they are doing right now and how that's playing out in our classrooms and the coaching that they're doing. Yeah. It's just it's just amazing. It's nice to see the bridge between <clears throat> the teaching and learning department and central office to the high school, what she's bringing over to the high school, and then what Gary and Greg then do, and then that bring out to the middle I schools or the elementary, wherever right. they're going. Yeah. I didn't want to steal their thunder either because I know they'll come here in December, but they ran a fantastic digital safety night last week mm -hmm. in, at the um, uh, Florence Warrior Cafeteria where we had a bulk of middle school parents come out for that day, and they just did a fantastic interactive presentation where they had parents on their devices involved in doing what, what kids are doing. Um, online and in their classes with the technology. So it's those connections that we're making between the schools and district offices and those kinds of things that are really um, Yeah, and I think well. the last thing I would say too is what I what I love about what I'm seeing uh, with the work that we're doing is it's tangible, it, it's authentic, and, and we can really implement it. And that's just amazing. So, so you'll see that coming. So that's that for that. Unless you have any questions on that, I will talk still about still water. No, we look forward to it. I mean, that's the meat of what we do. Um, it is. We have to talk yeah. about water and, <laughs> and, and, and stuff like that. But this more is more mundane thing. Right yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll just talk quickly about uh, Stowe Water um, and, and where we're at. I, I'm not looking for anything from you tonight. I, I, I don't think that we need to, like I don't need a vote or anything like that. So this is more informational uh, than anything else. And it's been so current that it was like, do we even have the time to throw this now onto the, the uh, superintendent's report? And I thought, no, we, we'll just leave it off for now. So <coughs> the last two nights there have been meetings in Stowe uh, with regards to where we're at with um, remediating the situation with the water, with the PFAS in the water um, in the, the Stowe buildings. Now keep in mind that those two buildings just yet, I know those of you who are in Stowe know this <coughs> all too well are still on the bottled water and will remain on bottled water until we can remediate this. And our kitchens are still using water pumps to wash everything. And I mean, it's, it, it is a big sacrifice right now. It, it, it's, it's not easy in those buildings. And, and I think that they're, both buildings are being commended for the work that they're doing and the effort that they're putting forward with this. And the kids have been phenomenal. Like they're, you know, somebody was saying to me today, yeah, my child came home and said, yeah, I need two more bottles of water to take back to school tomorrow. You know, the kids are being so, they're so resilient, you know. So um, I think that from our end, this has go gone very well. Of course, the fix is the big question, right? And how much and who pays for it? And, and we knew out of the gate that it probably wasn't gonna be a, a less than $10,000 fix. We, we knew that. Our concern initially was that we were probably looking at about $100,000 to $150,000 each building. We, we really didn't know where we were at. 
You know that we, because we've reported this out before, that we've worked very closely with the DEP and that <coughs> has continued um, to the point where they came up with the fix and um, I, I'm certainly not going to speak to the details here. I wouldn't even try to do that. Rob really is the expert in this area. Um, they, they pulled together a plan and then it had to go before DEP for approval. So even though that they were part of it, then there was like another branch, so to speak, that had to look at it and say, yeah, we'll give this a stamp of approval, this should work. So we're thrilled to say that we got that stamp of approval, so we're good. So I feel that our work in this area has been really solid. The next piece then was, okay, how much is this going to cost? How much is this fix going to cost? So, um, and we're, the schools are looking at this, but I believe the town of uh, Stowe, I think, is also looking at it for their own building, I believe. Um, and so they're in the same kind of position that we are right now. Um, uh, so we, we knew that they were going to have a town meeting, a special uh, town meeting coming up. Normally the school district doesn't um, generally participate in that because we generally just participate in the spring meetings and that's kind of what we, we aim for. However, with this, with this water situation, it made total sense to us. We, in conversation, by the way, as you know I would do, with Bill Wrigley, does it make sense that we put an article on now because we can see this coming. We need to get this fixed. We need to keep pushing forward with this. And he said, yes, let's put a placeholder on it. In the meantime, can you get your <coughs> folks, which they did, before our FinCom uh, and, and you know the, the committees that, they, that need to review it before it comes to the town meeting on November 18th, I believe, is the town meeting. So um, we we got numbers together, I want to say late Friday afternoon, I think is when the numbers came through. Um, and, and these are preliminary numbers, uh, they're not holding fast, but this is where the preliminary numbers are right now. For Center School, it looks to be 32,000, which is so far under the number that we thought it was going to be, and 25,000 for <coughs> So to us, we looked at this and thought, oh, these are doable numbers, these are workable numbers for us, right? And so we're, we're, th we're thrilled uh, that, that this is where they, they came in. We feel really good about the work that's been done. We feel it's been solid. Um, so last night, it was the Board of Selectmen <coughs> meeting. Um, and so these numbers came before the Board of Selectmen last <coughs> night uh, in Stowe. So I would just want you to know that this has been ongoing. Um, and you know I'm, I'm sure that we, we just want to put a plug in like we always would, you know, please parents feel free to go out and, you know, uh, attend those town meetings and, and uh, support whatever your heart says to support. So we want to put that out there again November 18th. Um, where do they normally hold it? Is it at Hale? or? Yeah, I think it's normally at Hale School. So, um, you know, we'll probably um, uh, tweet something out with some, some details on that. But just so that you know that that's coming and that's where we're at. Uh, right now, it's costing us about $5,000 a month for water, just to bring the water in. So if you start thinking about this, this is a total of like 50 some thousand, you know, it, it's going to get to 50000 pretty quickly if we have to keep putting 5000 bucks out every month for water. Uh, so it would make sense that, that we move forward with this. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Bill Wrigley and uh, Craig as well for all of their work in Stowe uh, and working with us. They're just great partners with us, so thanks to them. So if this is approved, um, what's the timeline for making the changes? In a perfect world, <laughs> I keep saying perfect world because we know it's not. In a perfect world, we'd be set to do this at Christmas, oh. uh, over the Christmas holidays. Okay. What we'd like to do, and it has to be done when the when no one's in the building. Certainly. So. Any other questions or comments for? I just think the payback <coughs> period is, is fantastic with with these numbers. We'll have it. You know, you'll have it paid back by not having to spend five thousand dollars a month exactly. water by the end of the year. So, mm -hmm. or by by the end of June. Yeah. So it's yeah. I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, it's, it's Leah, I'm not totally sure that this is a question for you guys, but well, I wonder if the town, why is the town putting it to vote with it being under the, the number that they have to? No, uh, let me, uh, so let me just step back for a minute here and let me explain that. Thank you for, for bringing that up. It's for the school district. If it's 10,000 or over, then we have to go to the town meetings. And this, these, both of these numbers are over the 10,000, so that's why we have to take it to the town. If it's less than 10,000, it's expected the school district pays for it. Thank you. So that's, that's the difference. That was a great question to ask. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or questions for Brooke? Thank you very that's much. It. Thank Good you. Report. So now we are on to new business. And we are going to 
entertain the global travel field trips approval requests. So, so the first one, one up <laughs> is for a trip to the Dominican Republic. Well, I think you're going to speak globally, if, if, if I might use the, the word. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to, we're going to talk about a, a broader view here, I think. And, and, I'm just uh, going by what's in there. No, you're going by what's in there. So somebody else so start talking, because yeah. I'm sure. obviously wrong. Go Paul. So uh, Greg and Lauren. Greg is a history teacher. Lauren is a biology and environmental studies teacher at the high school. Uh, have been instr instr instrumental in starting uh, to look at a global citizenship program at the high school. They're working with a group of other teachers in their PLTs, or in their PLT, um, to flesh out and imagine what this would look like at the high school. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been talking to folks from other high schools, as well as um, um, representatives from travel companies, and I think it's a good time for it. Um, Part of what this would allow for would be to plan trips out three, four, five years so that students coming in um, could have a sense, hey, that's, that's a trip I'm interested in, and they could plan with their families when they're, uh, when they're entering the high school for a trip later on. We, we want these trips to be designed so that students are encouraged to travel rather than um, uh, discouraged because of a price tag. Um, also, there are uh, curriculum connections with all of these trips, and uh, Greg and Lauren can talk about that a little bit tonight. Um, I think we all had the feeling, I, I look back at last year, and, and when field trips from the high school were brought forward, it seemed to be done in a kind of a piecemeal fashion. Each month it was a different, it was a different trip. And what we hope to do, in part, is coordinate these so that we can come together uh, with a plan laid out and, and looking at several trips. Um, that's the hope, and that's what we're building towards. Well, you mentioned the Global Citizenship mm -hmm. Certificate, and I think that is, um, I was in Concord when um, that uh, was started, so I'm, I'm familiar with it. And I think it's, it's helpful for people to know the larger context of what it is that these fit into. What does it mean for a student to get a Global Citizenship Certificate because that's what makes might make sense of of the plan. So if you could speak to that and and what the plan is and who's you know spearheading it. Sure, and and, and understand. I'd, I'd be happy. To I was going to say. I, I sure. was just going to add that. Thank you, Paul. I was going to mention too because Dr. McGuire has been actively involved in this too, and and I, I think in part of the visioning of this. And if I can just step back for a moment too for uh, our newer school committee members. I, I'm glad, Paul, that you brought up last year because it just seemed like it was like a piecemeal through no one's fault. That's right. And, and the, that's right. the truth is it was really a positive thing because it was really because we enforced that policy. Those of you who will recall that, remember, mm -hmm. before, when we started mm -hmm. saying, wait a minute, these trips are happening, we've never seen them, and we took a look at our policy and said, oh, And they're going know. next week. Yeah, What's the whole policy says, oh yeah. my that goodness. Was the, that, was, that was the difficult part. Yeah. That was, and so I, I you know, I, I remember back to poor Nathan Pritchard, gosh, you know, it was such a wonderful man, and, and I sometimes I felt like, and I'm sure he felt like he was a scapegoat at times, as we were kind of, wait a minute, what about this, this, that's a, you know, and so we revised the forms, and if, to our new school committee members, we revised the forms, we revised the process, and so this is kind of, like I feel like this is our next, Phase. This is our next level to bump it up a little bit more, and to have a, a more comprehensive overview. So with that, we we had spoken, and because this is absolutely within Dr. McGuire's wheelhouse, it made total sense to have him do the connection here and help to lead this. So I think there will be times when you're going to ask a question that probably Dr. McGuire would be the better individual to to respond to it. Not saying, Paul, that you don't know the answer, but I'm certainly uh, putting putting. Um, putting out there that he can certainly respond to any of these as well. So you might even want to take a, a stab at this uh, Sure, this response. yeah. So um, so I have um, helped develop a global competency program in one of my former schools when I was the director of social studies and global education. And it was a big push towards uh, global education, global competency diplomas, global citizenship certificates, and whatever that might look like. 
Um, and then at the time, you know, we looked at some schools who were who were looking at that. And at the time, um, GEM, GEM, Global Education in Massachusetts, was very active in, in promoting that and other organizations such as Primary Source. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we developed really a global competency um, program or really what we, what we considered at the time to be a pathway, mm -hmm. an educational pathway. And if you take a look at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education now and what they're really recommending is this idea of pathway programs for students in high school so that when they come in, they almost basically are focusing on a major. Mm -hmm. So that when they are done with their high school experience, they've traveled along almost a curricular pathway that's almost a concentrated field for them. And so this is one way to do that, um, devise a global uh, citizenship or global travel and curriculum pathway over four years, but you can also do it in areas of STEM, you can do it in areas of engineering, you can do it in, in really any, in any area. This is, this is just one. So the idea is really to uh, find a custom fit for Neshoba Regional High School and what that might look like. And these are the beginning stages. These guys are working in this professional learning community and, and really asking the right questions to other school districts and interviewing other school districts and working with companies such as Education First, EF Education, um, and figuring out what might be the best fit for, for our school um, in those infancy stages. But a lot of schools have developed what is considered like a global competency. So you go through a series of courses, or a series of travel, a series of experiences that at the end of your four years, you graduate with that kind of seal on your diploma. Mm -hmm. There's also now the seal of biliteracy that the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is working on, and Paul and I have talked about that. Um, it's allowing students to master a second language and taking an examination, and if they pass, they then get a seal of biliteracy on their diploma, which is all you know geared towards prepping students for beyond high school and college and career ready. So that's a little background, but it's certainly trying to identify what's going to work best for our high school. Mm -hmm. And um, these travel experiences, I think, are kind of at the root and the foundation of figuring out what what that is. And these guys have already had some fantastic opportunities to go train in. Where did you go again? Yeah. You went to Panama two weeks ago. already in sort of training for what these trips might look like for kiddos and connecting it to the curriculum. So does that answer your question, Cass? Yes. I think okay. one, one last point. Is, so again, the school could maybe should see that we're bringing structure to, to yes. some things that, that uh, previously were a little bit uh, skewed. And so we feel really good about this. And I think the kids, uh, going back to what Paul had said earlier, will know when they come into grade nine, oh, yes, here's, oh, I can see. So it, it's almost like. Pre-mapping it. Sure. For them. Mm -hmm. Mary? Just a quick question. So this is preliminary tool <coughs> where we don't have a global um, citizen certificate at this point or competency. This is the beginning this of that. This is the that. beginning. Okay. And so like I've worked with them and met with them okay. to say before we even begin that, let's lay some foundations. Like okay. first of all, like when kids come into the high school, it'd be great to it would be great to kind of have a travel plan. Mm -hmm. Where are we thinking of going? over the next four years and starting to present some of these things to you folks in the community to say, oh, I'm an eighth grader coming into ninth grade and I see that three years from now, you know, let's say that the band is planning to go to, you know, let's say Greece, for example. Okay. It gives them three years to plan ahead with their mm -hmm. families, let alone to prepare for that trip and to know financially that's where I might, where I might want to go or what I might want to do or it may be a student coming in and wanting to go Wherever that might be, but it's 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 putting a, a plan in place, and then hopefully then tying it to um, a curriculum that we can then build upon. All right, and I just wanted to say that I couldn't be more in favor of this. In fact, that my global my uh, doctoral dissertation is on global education. So you have Wonderful. an advocate right here. Anything I can do to help? Thank you, Steve. Okay, my my only question, and I've brought this issue up before, is you come into high school and you've got this three to four year plan of traveling all over the world basically, but your family is never gonna be able to afford it. Mm -hmm. And I know in the previous, in previ my, when I brought this up previously, I've said, I've been told, oh, there's money for, for those kids. But how do you get those kids to not be afraid to even bring it home <coughs> and, and, you know, breach it to their parents that, you know, the next, the, my next, Four years in high school are going to cost you fifteen thousand dollars in my world travels. How do we how do we do that? How do we deal with that? And that that to me creates or has the possibility of creating 
different classes of students mm -hmm. in the high school program, yeah. and I don't like to see that. No, and, and none of us would want to see that. I I so it's an that. excellent question, um, and it's one that is brought up again and again when we've gone to workshops mm -hmm. and they've talked about equity and opportunity mm -hmm. for kids. So it's it's certainly uh, it's on the front burner as as we look at putting something like this together. But there is no resolution for it at this time. Well, I mean, we we have we have we have scholarship monies that are available on an ad hoc basis now for this trip, that trip, the other trip. I noticed both of the trips are running about, about $3,800 a piece, mm -hmm. which is one trip, one year. Mm -hmm. um, so my idea, my, my, my thought of it being $15,000 over four years is not that far-fetched. Mm -hmm. And I, I think before, before we even um, put this put put this kind of a program into stone we need to be able to resolve that very thorny issue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so from my research there are districts um, and what they do is the fundraising is part of the whole process of the trip so that some families might be you know much better off than other families so that equity issue um, is, is definitely there but when the fundraising is, um, is part of the whole process, which is something to, to think about, then um, everybody has, has a chance to do the fundraising. In fact, it, it's part, it was part of the requirement. So it starts to erase some of that, doesn't completely. And some of my research showed that <clears throat> districts that are more affluent have more opportunities for students, it's clear cut, to, to travel and to do things. But there are ways, creative ways, to be able to start to make this um, more equitable for every student. So it is, it's a really good question. But there are avenues to help. Yeah. Well, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, so that was like, what we're working on right now is the four-year plan is our main one. And really, like, my favorite part is the equity piece of that. Because when we met with education first, they talked about, and different teachers talked about, how the fact that when you have a four-year plan, Yes, a student. We're not expecting a student to pay fifteen thousand dollars and go on every single trip. We're asking you to pick one trip and set a goal for that. So a freshman is going to be able to go as a senior because you can get a job babysitting and be setting aside that money if you have the desire and the willpower and you're backed by your parents to do that. It's not taking away money then. That's really the goal. My favorite part about four-year plan is how equitable it is, because Greg and I have talked a lot about how we were worried about the equity piece as well, because I literally had a student this year who was like, oh, I'd love to go to the Dominican, but I had to buy a car. So I was like, this is unfair. Why can't like she go? There's not enough money for this. Maybe if she had started raising money and known that there was something in eighth grade, that would have been more likely for her to do so. So we're not asking them to raise like that much. Also, like our trips are more expensive because we did like, mine was booked in April last year. If we had done it months earlier, it would have been a few hundred dollars cheaper. I had a similar experience with my students. I had a few kids that either told me they would have signed up and did it because of the money, or I had a couple kids sign up and then back out. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest thing for next year, we will probably be trying to promote next year's trips as early as next month. Because that's what we heard from the other schools was if you can tell the kids before Thanksgiving, the year before, then they have a chance to say to on South Coast and grandparents, I want to do this next year. And if you can give me my Christmas gift by supporting that trip, that'll, help, that'll make it so I can go. And we had a lot of kids who, um, we had some kids who said, no, I don't want to fundraise because minimum wage is high enough now that I'd rather go get a job. And so we had a number of kids who did that. Who came to me this, this fall and like, yeah, I got my first first job this year so I could earn the money to pay for the trip myself. And some of them paid for themselves and some of them, their parents matched um, or a relative matched. Um, but yeah, the four-year plan makes it so that they can do that. I, I, I think you're, that's you're right. Excuse me. Excuse me, Steve. Excuse me. Leah, did you have a comment to make? Well, I, so I don't mean to take away from your amazing efforts here, but one thing that I heard Todd just talking about was the likelihood of pathways, and I wonder if that is something that, because this has such potential for that, is the teaching and learning departments revisioning 
kind of moving in those directions around STEM, especially in engineering, and yeah. um, and I would just put a plug in for the humanities to you know continue to create pathways. <laughs> for if you look at his board right now, if you go the, to my the, office right now, you'll those see those, those families. Right there. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. yeah, I mean, I you know, and like Steve, you bring up a really really good point, and it is it is always the first question that is asked, and when I sit on a panel around global education, it is always the first question is asked around finances and. Um, certainly, same thing around you know pathways and building these opportunities and building these these, these pathways for kids. However, um, you know when we developed our global competency program, we made sure that it wasn't a requirement that you had to travel far away. In other words, global co travel could be domestic, and so or we sent kids to Montreal, which was a far more cost-effective way for them to get a global experience speaking. A foreign language or being in a culture that was you know considered global or traveling to Arizona or Santa Fe um, or also allowing students to attend cultural events that were global in nature that were say in Boston or New York City etc so we made it uh, you know we made it diversified so that students could could participate in and get credit for a variety of global experiences mm -hmm. Steve. that were well, there. I, I, I understand that, that mm. but once again, that, that, that kind of a thing is going to set up a hierarchy, especially among the kids. Well, we're going to go to the local things because we can afford that, but they're going to go to Italy, you know, or something like that. And mm -hmm. I, I'm really concerned about that because sure. uh, um, while, while we tend to look at our district as a somewhat uh, affluent, for the most part, um, mm -hmm. Organiz uh, not organization, but location or, or whatever, you, whatever you want to call it. We do have pockets here that each community has a, a you know, a, a food bank that they, that they provide. So we know that it's not universal, that, that the affluence is not universal. And I really, I really have a problem with maybe some of the kids and from our point of view we can say, well, that, you know, it's not real, but, but from their point of view perception is reality and that they feel stigmatized because well okay we can go to the you know the, the language thing in Boston but we can't go to you know a, a trip to Italy as, as some of our peers mm -hmm. can do and I think that's 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 a, that's a concern it's a concern of mine anyway as we move forward with this yeah. mm -hmm. the program itself sounds wonderful but once again you know it, it sounds like that this is a consideration that the high school has as well. And my experience um, in working with uh, the Global Competency Group in Concord was that they were really good at, first of all, it's not something that everybody wants to do. There, there were maybe, I think the first year um, of the, the certificate, there were maybe five kids, and then there were 10 kids, and then there were, there were 20 kids. But I, I think just the nature of, of the way the high school um, operates is that there is a um, knowledge of who might need a little bit more help than someone else and I think that um, that being aware of that and being aware of the kids who would really want to go but might not have the funds to do it and providing them with the assistance maybe if they know as I heard you folks say that someone wants to do this as a as a freshman, that by the time they get to be a senior, those those funds are available to them. So I, I'm glad to hear you taking the point. I think that this has been identified, but we would want to know as we move forward and and approve these trips and make it something uh, for Paul to share um, with Brooke um, what the breakdown is. Um, and we're just this is just the first iteration of this, correct? So moving forward, but I most certainly would want to know that any child, any student that wanted to take advantage of this um, had the opportunity and that we could provide help with support or guidance, whatever it is. I will say that I'm glad you brought it up about uh, some kids were able to get this cultural experience without leaving the country. And that worked for them because they really didn't want to <laughs> go to Europe or go to, to South America, but they wanted 
the experience, and part of the experience involves being fluent. And I mean, I guess it, in Concord, part of it was being fluent in the language, being able to um, um, understand, but 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 also being in an area that needed. You, you were there to do community service, mm -hmm. not to, um, you know, have a vacation. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of, of places in the United States. I mean, um, just one example that I can think of where a uh, student <coughs> had relatives um, in Southern California, <coughs> and that's where that individual went to have their cultural experience. And it, it has to be one. They don't have to do it every year. But I think that as we're starting, I think it's an incredible program and that we just need to collect the data and look. But um, I, I, I know that as, as, a, uh, as, a, as a school, uh, all the schools tend to know who are the kids that might need some extra help and work hard to provide it. And as kids get older, that means they have the capacity to, to work and... But just, let me, go, Jim, go just let me go back to my Absolutely. original thought yes. that there may be some kids who would like to do it, but don't even ask because they know that from their family's financial mm -hmm. situation, it mm -hmm. is an impossibility. Mm -hmm. And somehow we've got to let them know that there is an alternative mm -hmm. for them to be included in these programs and not to just kind of be, sit on the Absolutely. sidelines, and that, that that's yeah. that's that's not easy. It's I'm not saying it is, but it's. You know. I know, but I guess that from, based on my experience, and based on my experience with Neshoba, the the knowledge of the the students and their backgrounds and what their situations are is astounding. Because I agree, there is, but the it's just the, the I think that it's one of the strengths of this school system is the relationships that the faculty have with families and understanding family circumstances. So I hear your concern and I, I think that we have to keep that in, in the forefront, um, but I've always been impressed on who knows what about whom and who's willing to, to help out to the extent to which we've had, um, um, I always say unanimous when I mean anonymous, so I mean anonymous. Um, people that'll donate money yeah. to be used to no, help I, out. I, I, but I I'm glad that you raised it, and I hear that it's at the forefront of that, because you don't want to have an opportunity like this and have anybody who really wants to do it be left behind. So I'm sorry, Brooke. No, I, I was just going to say, I, I can't see us moving forward without dealing with that in some way or another, mm -hmm. Steve. So I, 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 you know, it's not lost on us, and it's clearly not lost on them. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, but I do want to go back to, because we kind of side and side real here a little bit here. So I want to make sure that you have the chance to say whatever you would like to say right now too about this. So um, so Paul, let, let's turn it back I to you. Know, Lauren, I, I, I guess I would turn it over to Lauren and Greg to talk about their respective trips. Do you want to hear about Italy or Dominican first? Let's, let's do the Dominican first. Okay. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> so, um, the Dominican trip would be over February break. It's a service trip. So in the future, we're hoping to do like a cultural trip, a language trip, and a service trip, as well as keep the remaining trips like the German exchange and um, the Malawi opportunity that they have. But that's the Dominican. Um, they have about seven, eight students that are signed up right now. So I would be the chaperone from Neshoba with our students. It's a really good mix of students because you have students all the way from 10th grade to 12th grade. It was opened up to freshmen, but I have some interested, so the number could switch a little bit, but next week by Monday, we'll know for sure. Um, so they would be going to the Dominican and working with the mangroves and the coral reefs there, specifically for marine conservation, which is why I, as a science teacher, was very excited about that. It's a really um, biodiverse region, but at the same time, it's also a very threatened region, especially when you talk about the environmental issues going on there. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the big part I was really excited about. And like you talk to the kids and you're like, it's a service trip. They're going to be working with the mangroves, working with the coral reef in this area where they're working with a nonprofit that it's through EF, so they've established a relationship with this nonprofit. Um, which is really cool. They also get to like, meet with different people from the Dominican and learn about like ecotourism 
and fishing because it's a big fishing community there. They're not really, they do visit to some cultural areas as well, but when they're working, it's more like a rural area. They're not like totally city because it's a specific service trip. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a nutshell of what it is. So again, it's about like seven to eight students that would be going. We would be traveling with two other schools. We actually, when we went to Panama, we were meeting with other global teachers so or people interested in that and Duxbury is going at the same time so I actually met with their teacher there she was awesome <laughs> if I can say that um, so we know we're going with them and probably another Massachusetts school which is also a really good opportunity for us like we talked about Skyping before we go so the kids can meet each other which is a good opportunity for them to build relationships here in Massachusetts not just in the Dominican um, yeah so Safety wise, just to like put that out there, um, they do, EF has people on the ground at the Dominican and they have a 24 seven um, phone service so that you always can be in contact. Um, yeah, so it's really good with that. We have a tour guide as well. So they're kind of taking over and then both Greg and I are going on a training tour. So I literally over Veterans Day weekend, I will be in the Dominican learning how to lead a trip like this. So I, just going to Panama made me feel a lot more confident, but I will feel extra confident because I've gone to the Dominican doing the same thing because I have gone to the Dominican before, but not doing marine conservation, which is really exciting. So. Questions for Lauren about the trip? Yeah. I guess I'm just having trouble Reading this, does it say the total cost of the trip is one hundred and sixty thousand dollars? Whoa, no. no! It <laughs> says the total cost is thirty-seven hundred dollars. But to the left of that, to, it says the total cost to students thirty-seven hundred dollars. This is the Almagain, Italy. Yeah, and that's the total of all the students. Yeah. That's obvious. Oh, okay. And all the total the cost. I'm sorry. I'm the total so cost sorry. of the trip is actually twenty-nine six. And that that's what that means. Total cost of the trip for everybody that that oh, goes in. Eight kids go. Yeah. Um, twenty nine six to the Dominican. It's for the t if eight students go and each one pays thirty seven hundred, then the total cost would be twenty nine thousand six hundred dollars. I guess my question uh, is, um, and maybe I'm just ignorant. Uh, that seems so high. For uh, thirty seven hundred dollars. I don't know. Am I wrong? Well, is that include airfare? It includes airfare and it includes like um, insurance and all their hotels and like their meals and everything. So the mm -hmm. only thing extra that they would need is it spending money and tip money. So which is usually like thirty or forty dollars for mm -hmm. the week. So because they tip their tour guide because their tour guides are so amazing. And EF Tours is not the one in charge of the marine conservation, are they? You they partner lead, with someone else? They're partnering with the people who do marine conservation as a living. Um, so the way EF works is that they work with nonprofits and they keep their, they check out the nonprofits. They only work with ones that they can build a really good, solid relationship with. They've had this, this is one of their first service trips because the service trips, if I'm not mistaken, Todd, they came around like several years ago. They're fairly on the newer side. And this is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, like they've been going to the Dominican for a long time, considering so the last several years. And it's been really good for that. Part of the money too, like if we, when we are going there, we are helping that group. So we're buying the stuff that we're using to like work with them. Mm -hmm. So it's also like you're, if you're, for example, say you were planting mangrove trees, which we won't be doing, but like in that scenario, you'd be buying stuff to help buy the mangrove trees because you're donating that services too, so that all of that would go. So it includes everything plus like the service into it so that you can experience that. And so some of the cost is related to the, the actual work that doing, they're doing. Yes, the service that they're doing. Another question? The, um, what's the, the cap on the number of kids right now that you said there were eight? Going? So there's 25 total. It's different for the cultural trips. Um, you, but with the service trip, EF specifically limits it to 25. But right now you have eight. Right, so that's why we're going with two other schools to fill a bus. I see. Mm -hmm. And is there a point at which you would have another chaperone from Neshoba? Or if we hit 12. Okay. But we haven't hit 12. So. Okay, but if you did, is there someone who would be yes. willing to go? Yeah, I asked her like six months ago. Okay, so. great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I stole her from Greg. Yeah. Uh, so. That's good. Um, any other questions for Lauren? 
Okay, um, Steve, could you make the motion? I'd like to move to approve the NRHS global travel request as presented for eight students and one chaperone to travel to the DR on February 15th through February 22nd, 2020. May I have a second? Oh, oh, yes. I'm sorry. That's okay, sir. No, I'm going to ask a question after you get your second. I'm sorry. Well, you want to do the second while you're... I'll second the motion Joe for purpose seconds. of discussion. Okay. Right. Um, All right, question questions? I have, yes. I actually have a two-part question. One is, <coughs> so we're being asked to approve this trip to the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. and to Italy. Yes. So let me just ask this question. As far as what's presented to us, it states on the, 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 the approval form that accommodations are to be determined. Why is that not set before it's brought before the committee? Mm -hmm. um, they don't book anything until we have our final numbers. So within the next month or so, they should start booking those things. Like we don't have our flight information. Like we don't even know specifically like what everything is detailed until everything's established. That's why. But they have a couple of hotels that they usually use, and they always check out the hotels that they do okay, use. Okay, so, so basically the, 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 the program on the ground in the Dominican Republic basically sets up where the people stay, and they have a relationships with the hotels. And yeah. so they have, okay, because I'm wondering how, they, how you set the cost without knowing the accommodation costs. So, yes, yeah. that's the cost. Yeah. If you read about EF is, is education first, they're, they're a, a, a premier educational tour company, and um, that there's a lot of information about them in, in, in addition to the trip. So, yeah, they have connections there, but what is the nature of the accommodations? It'll be a hotel? Yes, it'll be okay. a hotel. So let me ask the committee this. Do you want to wait until we know what the hotel is and um, before we approve? Or do you, what, what is your feeling about that? Uh, I would just chime in on that EF because you're working with a company like them. Oftentimes, the the flight information and the hotel information comes within 30 days of leaving for the trip. So just F, just so you know, working with a company like that because they're obviously trying to book bulk rates on flights, yeah. um, and as well as booking hotels and getting feedback from the the number of like she says there'll be two other schools traveling with them. So making mm -hmm. sure that they can get everybody accommodated into the same hotel if they'll be traveling on the same bus. So. Mm -hmm that if you're waiting for that, it would probably be within like 30 to 45 days before the actual trip. So just putting that out there, because that's usually when that information comes through mm -hmm. from a company like that, and that would be any company. Okay. My second question is, um, you mentioned about insurance. What, could you elucidate a little more on insurance? What, what is covered by the insurance? Like if they had to move last second for some reason, if the tour got canceled, that kind of a thing. What about um, health insurance? There's emergency travel insurance. Uh, if one of the kids had an, an injury where they where they couldn't even travel back, that insurance covers the parent flying over to Italy or the Dominican to, to be with them in order to get them back. I, I guess I don't my, remember all the numbers. I, but. I guess my question really pertains more to if a student, and, and again, I'm, I, I'm fully supportive of, of, of the program sure. the travel. I'm not looking to throw a monkey wrench here. But I guess when you mentioned insurance, the question that I have is, let's say a student decides to go on one of these trips and they're injured mm -hmm. and they require medical attention. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, does, how does the um, program, if you know, uh, address those costs and concerns uh, when they're in a foreign country? That would be the to <clears throat> EF. Yes, I think so, but I think Todd probably has the best answer here. <laughs> well, I know that Pat could probably speak to the insurance that the school district because we, right. we have field uh, we've, we've had we've had students go on field trips just to Sturbridge Village where mm -hmm. we've had a kid injured <laughs> right well it doesn't matter really where it is but in terms of our school district has health insurance number one but also EF also has insurance and I've been in situations where I've been in a hospital with a kid I've been in a pharmacy with a kid who's needed a prescription and and it you know that that is covered by the program my, my issue and again, I'm not looking to, I'm going to vote in favor of this, but my, my just so I, I understand this. It, it, going with what Superman just said, if, if they're in the United States mm -hmm. and they need medical attention, mm -hmm. generally speaking, they're going to be able to secure those services through whatever health insurance they have. Okay. But our domestic insurance doesn't necessarily cover costs and expenses incurred in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. and. The reason I bring this up is, is that I've, in, in my profession, I've, I've seen this come up, 
And I've seen some people get into some real jams mm -hmm. when they've been injured, when they've gotten sick in a foreign country. And the individual is then taken to the hospital and there becomes a real problem if the services are rendered and there's no payment there to be, to be tendered. So I'm just wondering if the program that you utilize in the Dominican Republic, in Italy, um, whether or not if a child uh, it becomes ill or is injured, whether they, ha they cover the costs or there's insurance there to cover the costs of any medical procedures that are rendered on behalf of the child. Mm -hmm. so. Do we know that? Do we know how that works? I don't remember the exact numbers on the insurance, but it, it is meant to cover the costs. That's what I was under. That's what I believed, but yeah. You can double check. I don't that remember the limits. Certainly, I can bring that with me. Sure. I also wonder if it's an optional insurance or no. if it's a well. Of the EF cost. says yeah. it's optional, but as as leaders, we can say no. This is required if you want to go on our trip, and both right. of us did that. Okay, so yes. these numbers are inclusive that of that optional yes. insurance. Yes. Yeah, so didn't want to have there's no way. <laughs> yeah. No. We're not doing that. Um, I feel that there are some um, questions that folks want answers to. Um, and I know that we have, I'm sorry, what? Are, are there? I, I'm not sure. Well, I, Joe's expressed. No, I, I, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm I was going to say expressed a concern that um, uh, about uh, students being covered if they're injured over overseas and what insurance picks up. Is it the insurance that they buy for the trip, or is it their parents' insurance? Is that what the question is? Yeah, look, I, I had a conversation with an individual one time that his wife was from Canada. Mm -hmm. And I've lived my life here in the United States with the understanding that Canada, being a socialist country, has socialized medication and medicine, and that there's no issues or problems if you get sick up in Canada. But he said to me one time, he said, you know, if I ever got sick, I told my wife, put me in a car and get me to Vermont as soon as possible. So my concern is, I just don't want to see, I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about the students. I'm, I'm fully supportive of the trip. And you're saying that there's money there and insurance there to bring a parent over to the country. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want is any parent in this district being confronted by administrators at, hot at hospitals telling them, listen, you know, we're either A, not going to provide any further services, or B, we're not going to release the student until these accommodation, until these uh, costs are paid. Mm -hmm. And I know you're probably sitting there thinking, what is this guy talking about? But I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not an educator. I sit here and listen to all this stuff you guys have about education. But in my profession, this happens. Mm -hmm. And I would really hate to see that happen. And, and if there's insurance in place, then I'm taking up oxygen by even bringing it up. But I was just wondering about that when Laura mentioned insurance. Mm -hmm. So, But to answer the superintendent's question, I'm fully supportive of it. No, I think we all are, but if there are, are questions um, that can be answered by our next meeting and you guys want to put the vote off until the next meeting, we have the second, we have to do what? There's plenty of time. Yeah. I'm, and I'm happy to bring the full mm -hmm. um, sure policy the from EF. The, the EF is running both of these trips. I've traveled extensively with EF before. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to bring it in front of the committee if people want to look at it so they can see exactly what it is. Um, the I'm other thing it would be helpful to get is we might not know, and, and the plane's going to get them there. That's not mm -hmm. the issue. Um, the lodging accommodations, what the options would be, because there are probably two or three hotels that mm -hmm. they would use. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's up to the committee. I mean, um, if you want to uh, come back when there's with more information, or if you're ready to vote now, what's your pleasure? More info. Leah? Uh, I would want to not inconvenience them to come back again, but I would like more info. Mary? So if, if we had that insurance binder from EF right now that Todd could show us, I'd feel more comfortable. I mean, I am totally in favor mm -hmm. of this. this no, I, that's what I'm hearing, but yeah, we have questions we want answered, and that's why we do this. I also think because EF has been, in, you know, it's reputable, it's been around a long, long time. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. I've known about it for 20, maybe not 20 years, but, mm -hmm. uh, but this would help us too going forward with other trips because then we would feel more comfortable that we know what that insurance means. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we could just put it off um, and get that into, I'll get that information. Mm -hmm. It might make a lot of sense. Um, I, I tend to agree with Leah. I mean, these teachers have come out on a school night to present this. Um, it would be, I, I feel like it would probably be an inconvenience to ask them again. And in the past, I feel like we've had votes where we've approved it 
pending certain conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I almost feel like that would be an appropriate avenue mm -hmm. so that we wouldn't have to drag you guys out again on a school night. I mean, it's already 7.30 for them to do that again. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's all that necessary. Mm -hmm. We can have it pending, you know, the release of the, the binder. Mm -hmm. Jesse? No, I, I don't feel strongly about it one way or the other, <coughs> um, whatever the committee wants to do. I, I would say this, though, and I, I'll say this from more of a, a, a civic-minded perspective. Um, you know, if the district wants to run trips and do this, that's fine. But if you're asking me to vote on it, I have to say it would be, I'd feel more comfortable voting on anything if the information was, you know, encapsulated. And like I say, I'm looking at the approval form. It doesn't say where they're staying, but it has a cost. And I said, well, okay. And then there's the issue with the insurance. And, I, I'm, and, and forgive me, I'm not certain I'm hearing that there's a lot of certainty regarding exactly what the insurance covers. If I'm mistaken in that regard, please you know, let me know. But I, I'm just not hearing that. But, you know, whatever the committee wants to do, I'm, I'm comfortable I, with. I can just, uh, overall, I, the, it, it is, uh, because I'm looking at it now, it's the Global Travel Protection Plan. It costs $165 mm -hmm. for each student to pay. It does, co it does cover tour cancellation and interruption coverage. It does co cover illness and accident coverage, which is all hospital bills, doctor's fees, and medical transportation for illnesses or injury while on tour as well as travel and accommodation expenses for a parent or family member to be with child while hospitalized or in doctor's care in the event of a life-threatening injury, baggage and property coverage, and flight delay coverage. But I can also print out the entire policy for you folks if you'd like to look at it as well, if that helps. Just to answer the question. Just but I can print out the policy and, and, right. and, and certainly give it to all of you. Um, the, the concern you expressed was what did it cover? And, and that's what it, it covered, which sounds pretty good for $160. <laughs> My experience. I mean, I have traveled with them yeah. extensively, and I have had injured students. I've had hospitalized students. Um, I've, I've been in a, in a pharmacy with a student who needed a prescription, and, and it was all covered with the insurance plan. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Were they in foreign countries? Yes. They were? Okay. Yes. All right. Does, any other questions about the insurance? It, it sounds pretty comprehensive. But if you're not prepared to vote on that and you'd like me to print out the entire policy so you can read it in its entirety, we can, we can do that too. I'm happy to do that. So I just have one question. Does it say that um, the individual's um, you know, primary insurance would be considered first and then this would be? It doesn't say that in this quick overview, but okay. it may do that in the full. So I can yeah. certainly look at that. OK. Because otherwise, what a deal that would be. <coughs> So if our primary concern was wanting to know about the insurance, um, does that does the information that Todd um, provided assuage our concern? I have a question. Leah? So I feel better about the insurance piece, mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially because it's a service trip, I think that the likelihood of injury might be greater, maybe not. Um, but I feel better about that now. Do you guys think that it's OK that we don't know the accommodations. Are you confident that that will be? I mean, the Dominican Republic is not Italy. Um, it's certainly not going exactly. to New York City. So um, are you, do you think that it's legitimate to approve something like this without knowing where they're going to be staying? I, my first reaction is yes, uh, knowing the company. But I just I'll, know the I'll I know talk. the company so well, mm -hmm. and I know that they do not stay anywhere below a three-star hotel. Um, I know if there have, and you can go, you know, if there have been complaints in the past, they do everything they can to remedy a situation. Okay. If, if, if that is the case, I mean, that is, that is why you work with a tour company, mm -hmm. um, because they are on the ground with you. They have somebody on the ground with you at all times. Um, no matter what country that you are in, if you are in an emergency, there's somebody from the U.S. in that country who can get to you immediately. Um, but I know in terms of accommodations, there is a reason why you don't find them out right away because of what I explained earlier. Same thing with flights, because they're, you know, they're booking for groups of people mm -hmm. and making sure that they can accommodate everybody where they need to. But I know EF does not accommodate in anything below a three-star hotel, as, as in the past when I've worked with them. I think to answer your question, I'd, I'd be prepared, prepared to vote. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I would too. Okay. I wonder when that, um, that time frame comes along and we do find out the accommodations, 
Yes. Not yeah, you would have to can. come here. We could get up early. Just tell Todd and he'll tell us. That's, that's what I need for you to go through this again. That's and, what I'm and we can also reach out to them now. I mean, yeah. EF is EF is a phone call away, and we can say we, our school committee really would like to know what are the options for our lodging yeah, when that's we visit the Dominican to Republic. Yeah. Could you could you at least give us a list of hotels where they will be staying or mm -hmm. would maybe be staying, and mm -hmm. we can provide that for you. Okay. They're wonderful in terms of you know working with so they, they would provide that for us right. well I'm going to call the vote we have the motion we have a second all those in favor opposed <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you get to go but you know because we've done just the, the one trip right so we, we still have this is going to be smooth okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I've done this trip I've done this oh, trip I, I know you're <laughs> in the promo video so now we're That's looking right. at um, the trip uh, to Italy, Venice, Florence, and Rome. Um, okay, airplane bus. Again, TVA, we're going to get information. Uh, EF Tours, you've got the total. You've got um, any questions? Anything you want to tell us about the trip? I mean, it's not a surface trip. Mine, I'm a history teacher, so going to see some of the most important cities in, in at, at that time, at least they were the most important cities in the world or among them. Um, so I'm really excited to take kids to see the Colosseum, the Sistine Chapel, uh, Doji's Palace. Uh, the kids are really excited to have pizza and <laughs> gelato. That was the, and some of them are really excited to see the Sistine Chapel. Uh, but. That, that those are some of the big things for them. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for the kids to, to see a different part of the world, to experience a different culture, um, experience travel for the first time for a lot of them, and, and see what they're capable of uh, out in the world. Uh, a great opportunity for growth and to, to be global citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, and EF is going to lead the tours for you folks? The same, same as with Lauren. We're, we're working with EF. We have the same advisor okay. uh, that we've been con consulting with and making plans. I have 42 kids only because that's at the limit for the bus. Okay. I have, I have three kids waiting on a wait list that every once in a while come up and say, Any, anybody dropped? And that's, mm -hmm. um, I wish I could bring all of them. I mean, that was, sure. it's, it's hard. I know I have one that's saying she's going to drop, so I've got one kid who Fingers, fingers crossed that she gets in the trip, and who knows what will happen with, with the, the other two that are waiting right now. Uh, and I have seven chaperones, so we have that six to one ratio, including we have a, a nurse coming with us, oh. um, which I think yeah, that was a recommendation Todd made. That's with 42 kids, would be a good idea to have that extra sure. uh, medical expertise uh, on the ground with us. Okay. So. Questions for Craig? Lately. Mine's more general about the program itself, just the larger program. Will these trips happen uh, yearly? What we're looking at is, is probably three to four trips a year. Mm -hmm. um, so some of, you know, February vacation like Lawrence this year, April vacation, and hopefully we can have some that are in the summer. Because some trips, it would be really hard to go to, say, Asia, you know, and, and we, we looked at things like going to the Great Wall of China. Are you going to try to squeeze that in in April vacation or to go to Thailand or to, uh, there's service trips that go to places like Tanzania that are going to take longer than, than eight to ten days, which is what you can squeeze in a school vacation without missing time, which we really don't want to. Uh, and so a trip like Italy filling up almost immediately, we'd probably offer it again in three years. So the current freshmen, none of whom got to go to Italy, would have that opportunity again as seniors. And then we'd look at what else uh, are the, are offer the most educational value for the students so that we can try to build a, a strong rotation of trips mm -hmm. so that you know maybe the Dominican Republic this year didn't get a lot of kids, but maybe after some of the kids go, they'll go, that was an amazing thing, you've got to do that. Mm -hmm. And their younger siblings or that, you know, a couple years later when Lauren goes back there, uh, you'll have more kids and, and you continue to build relationships, which was one of the things we heard from some of the other schools is it's not just the EF trips that they do. Mm -hmm. you know, most of them work with them or have in the past and have worked with other companies, uh, which was good to hear about. Um, but uh, some of the best trips they do are the, 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 the German exchange that mm -hmm. Mayor Pritchard does is amazing. So we don't want to interfere with that. Um, others have done exchanges with, um, with the, in Japan they had a baseball team that came over and they were able to play baseball together and they had a group of kids that were able to go over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think this is just, like we said, this is the beginning and this is one aspect of that global citizenship program. Um, mm -hmm. 
and hopefully we'll be able to build significantly more over the next few years. Um, but it'll be it'll it'll take some time. And I think you know, to go back to the the biggest issue that we have of that that equity. I think as we build it, we'll be able to to find ways to get to garner support and find ways to build scholarship programs into it. Uh, and we don't have it now just because we're just starting. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. to answer your question, yeah, we're going to be repeating trips so mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And pro providing, yeah. hopefully, uh, priority to the, those ninth graders, for example, mm -hmm. right? who didn't get the first opportunity. And, th and that'll be, and with some trips, you, you, you prioritize based on class, because we're, we're going to tie things to c curriculum. Mm -hmm. So Lauren has trips that she's looking at that are really about sustainability. So if you have kids in a sustainability class, maybe you open it up to them first, mm -hmm. and they get to sign up. Certainly the language classes, you know, if you're going to do an exchange to Germany, that's for the, the German students. You know, we have a couple of Spanish teachers in our PLT who have never traveled with students but really want to. And so we're talking about one or two of them working together to lead a trip next year. And maybe after a couple of trips, maybe then they can start finding a relationship, whether in Latin America or in Spain, uh, where they can have an exchange program that runs similar to the German trip every other year. Uh, we, that seems to be the, the what most of the school districts we talk to have done, but none of it's none of it's set in stone yet. We're still really uh, trying to figure out what's going to work best and try to get things running. Okay, okay. thank you. Excuse me. I'm sorry, but um, can I ask if anyone else has a question, please? Oh, of course. Other questions or comments oh, for Greg? Okay, is there anything different that you want to ask? Uh, this is, is we have to approve the. There is. Yes. So to your point about equity. I would say that not only financial equity, but also opportunity, equity around opportunity, and mm -hmm. kids falling through gaps mm -hmm. it should be something that you can One of the chaperones I went and asked last spring when I got approval <coughs> was one of the special ed teachers, uh, because I want mm -hmm. every kid in the school to, to have an opportunity mm -hmm. if they want. And so bringing um, our transitions teacher along, the goal is for her to be able to come and say, okay, this is what I experienced, so that when a, a parent or a student says, hey, is this trip for my kid too? They can say, yes, and here's how we can do it. Mm -hmm. And we can create that plan for all of our students. So that's absolutely right up there with the financial issue. <coughs> and also with, with EF, with our, um, we're gonna have a follow-up meeting with all of the people that we met with. And one of the things they asked was, what else do you want to address? And I realized I, I didn't ask anybody, but I had thought about it and didn't ask, how do you deal with students with medical issues? I have a student who has diabetes, mm -hmm. and it's fragile. And she's heard about these trips, and she goes, I want to do this. I said, well, you can. It, you know, people with diabetes travel all the time, but she's intimidated by the idea. And so I want to be able to talk to people, OK, how do you deal with your kids in special ed? How do you deal with kids who have medical issues? Uh, what are the protocols that, you're, that other schools have put in place so that we have that um, to build off of? Perfect. Does that answer that? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. I mean, and this is, I know we're spending a lot of time, but it's information we did not have. Mm -hmm. I think the context of the global um, competency program is important for people to understand because these things don't exist in isolation. They're not just random trips. They go, they're, the, the intention is to make them um, a part of that larger vision of the global competency. So thank you, everyone, and thank you for um, all of the information. So if there are no more questions for Greg, would someone like to? I'm going to call on Steve. Well, I've, I've, I've got the sheet here, so I... <laughs> I'm, yeah. I move to, to approve the NRHS global travel request as presented for 42, 42 students and seven chaperones to travel to, it, to Italy, Venice, Florence, and Rome on April 27th through, I'm sorry, April 17th through 24th, 2020. Thank you. Second, please. I'll second. Thank you, Leah. Um, any other questions, comments? My only, I would only make, like to make one comment. Yes, sir. I think this is great. Great. I do too. I only wish we had that opportunity to go when I was in high school. <laughs> Ditto. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank, thank you, you folks very for your work. Yeah. Uh, Greg and Lauren, I want to thank you so much for your efforts here. I really do uh, appall. Uh, 
thank you so much because it, it's clear to me the amount of work that you've put into this, and I thank you so much. We believe in it. Thank you. 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 Good job, guys. Okay, now let's talk about wrestling, shall we? <laughs> Should they fall asleep? I, I'm a little, yeah, I'm a little fall asleep. Okay. Tanya <laughs> Rich, you're on. Let's go. So my request is a little bit different. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're, not, we're not going to. Yeah, of Please. course you were not going anywhere fun. Um, but we've got um, members of our wrestling team um, that have been top wrestlers in our state and in nationally ranked right now. And because of this, and this has all happened during our regular wrestling season, but also in the off season when they're wrestling for club into the summer and this fall. And because of their success, we've been invited to some pretty top notch tournaments coming up this season. Um, so we've got a tournament in New York at Massapequa and a tournament in New York, it's called the Eastern States. Both of these tournaments are so Massapequa is the toughest holiday tournament in New York. Um, and we've been, have been invited, our top three vouchers have been invited here because of national rankings. Um, so this tournament, you know, when it makes my request different is all these tournaments, the kids are traveling with their families. They are representing the Shoba and my, our coaches are going down to coach them. So I felt like we had to come here in front of you to get approval and permission, but they are traveling with their family, they're staying with their family, they're eating with their family. They're driving to and from with their family. They're not going on a school bus. Um, we're not providing you know, transportation, hotel accommodations, or food. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we are leaving the state for these tournaments, so I wanted to get permission. Sure. Um, the Eastern States, um, my coach has wanted to get into this tournament for seven years, and this is the first year we've gotten the invite. So he's very excited to have this opportunity. This is a top 10 tournament in the nation to be invited to. Um, and he's excited because he was telling me that the number one team in the nation will be here wrestling here. So that is big. So our kids could be seeing some of the top wrestlers um, in, the, in the nation. And then the last tournament is a tournament in Connecticut, which is called the Danbury Quad. So there's four teams that are there. And this is for our entire team was invited. And we're the only team from Massachusetts invited to this tournament. Um, Danbury has been the Connecticut state champs for numerous years. Timberlane is the New Hampshire state champion, and Xavier is the runner-up in Connecticut, and then there's Neshoba. So again, this is a top, these are the top teams in New England. Um, these are all teams in the top 30 in our area, and again, one of the only you know, nationally ranked tournaments around that we've been invited to. And again, that one, we bring our 14 um, top wrestlers, which is a full weight class, but again, they'd be traveling with their parents, they'd be representing Neshoba, our coach would be coaching in that day-long tournament, but they're gonna be with their families the entire time. And this is typical for wrestling families. Um, they're used to this kind of tournaments, going away for weekends, being away. Um, some of our wrestlers were actually in Georgia a few weekends ago. Not with Neshoba, because we can't coach yet, but they're with their clubs, but they do, they're used to this traveling. Um, so these are the three that, you know, as we get going, um, these different tournaments are asking for us to, you know, confirm our confirmation that we will be attending. And so I wanted to bring this to you up front um, and get permission for us to leave the state for these tournaments. Thank you for the lead time. I was trying to make sure I got ahead of it as much as I could. Thanks. <laughs> I'm liking these dates. Um, does anyone have any questions for Tanya? Mike. Um, Tanya, I realize that the majority of the time is, the vast majority of the time is spent with parents and staying yes. at hotels. Is there any cost at all to the students uh, with regards to registration fees? So the school would cover the registration fee, um, which is what we do for numerous sports, including you know cheerleading and wrestling. When you have to go to these tournaments, there is usually you know a couple hundred dollar registration fee. But once they are there, like I said, it's the parents that are staying in a hotel and they're traveling with their families at that point. Other questions? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, it's, it's not here, does it need to be here that, that the school is covering any of those registration costs? I don't think so, because, because the, what we have on, on the other forms relates to what the students are responsible for. So they, there's no cost okay. to the student, essentially. Understood. Okay. Who feeds the coaches? They feed themselves. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Are you cool with that? I'm cool with that. Right. And Massapequa can be an exciting place. I've lived I've near it. I've lived beside it of uh, Massapequa for, for 15 years. So. They let us, Massapequa, um, they invite us to practice there. And I guess they have a huge wrestling room and it's, I saw pictures online and it's beautiful. 
Um, so that's part of going to Massapequa. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right, I'm going <coughs> to All right, Steve first motion, move to approve the NRHS varsity wrestling team's travel request as presented to Massapequa High School, Massapequa, New York, on December 27, 28, 2019, <coughs> to include three students and two chaperones. Second. Second. Thank you. All those in, any other questions or comments? I have a quick question. Yes. What? Um, did you say three students? Yes. Or 14? So, oh, this one is just three. Massapequa. Massapequa is three, okay. and the Eastern States is three. And then we're allowed to bring a full team to the Danbury Quad. And there, you have a motion for each individual one? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Second, Steve? Uh, move to approve the NRHS Varsity Wrestling Team's travel request as presented to Sullivan County Community College and Lock Sheldrake. New York on January 10th, 11th, 2020 to include three students and two chaperones. Second? Second. Questions? All in favor? Opposed? Okay. And number three, mm -hmm. move to approve okay. the NRHS varsity wrestling team's travel request as presented to Danbury High School, Danbury, Connecticut on January 31st, February 1st. 2020 to include 14 students and two chaperones. Second. Okay. All in favor? I just want to make a comment. Yes. This is so exciting. I mean, congratulations. <coughs> I know just, this is very exciting. You know, the players to you, I mean, what an honor all, all three of these are. So I hope they have a wonderful experience. Thank you. Okay. okay. That's all. Thank you, Mary. Say. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank you. And I uh, echo Mary Senenek. Thank you so much and congratulations. That's Thank you, Paul. <laughs> okay. Next new business is the policy manual sections. Oops. G and J. And um, just as we did the last time, um, I'd like to start with the, excuse me, let me get my, okay, um, just if anybody had any uh, questions about anything in Section J that they wanted to ask about. I'm sorry, you said Section J. I'm sorry, I mean G. I have a problem with those two letters. <laughs> I don't know why. Yes. Um, Kathy, I know you and I spoke offline about this, but there are a few of these um, policies where the recommendation is um, to delete the policies um, because the uh, MASC didn't have the policies. And it seems like there are at least a few of them. Um, and I wonder if there was sort of like a period of time where so, so why the transition, I guess? Why, why and when was the transition? Which, which, I don't understand your so, question. So, for example, um, uh, G, uh, GBGAA. G, policy wait a minute, just a minute, please. GBGAA, yes. Policy for health insurance. Yep. Um, so MASC didn't have these policies. They were the show policy, policies. Mm -hmm. And we deleted them. Is that all because these types of... Um, Actions which are kind of either deletions or not actions, all because of collective bargaining, because they're they're now a part of the collective bargaining. Not that one. I don't know how to answer that one. We will have to hold it out, and I will get the answer. If you're talking about GBGAA policy for health insurance, that's right, under the Federal Affordable Care Act, and the following one, I recall um, uh, when that policy was written. So I'm not sure why it was deleted. Um, and we created them when the law changed relative to those topics. So I would recommend we hold those out. Anything else? Hold them out until I can get an answer. Anything else in G? I move to adopt. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So. 
I'm not hearing anything relative to G other than to hold out GBGAA and GBGAA-R-ADG uh, for further clarification. Um, Kevin, would, yes. Can you read that a little smaller? No. <laughs> GBGAA. AA. Yep. And GBGAA. Dash R. Dash. A, B, G. And they're related to um, policy for health insurance under the Federal Affordable Care Act. And then the second one, that dash R, dash A, D, G, is procedural. So I would understand why that would be deleted, but we'll revisit this on the 20th. Any other questions or comments about anything in G? Yes, Leah. I wonder when, this is just a procedural question, when the policies are just from NRSD, does MASC still upload them for us onto the online? Whatever we adopt is what they will upload. Okay. Now when you say adopt MASC policy and there are a number of those, it's because we didn't have a policy in that area. And so okay. we adopted theirs. But they'll still review NRSD. I was just going to go there. Go <laughs> okay. So, you know, that's a great question. My concern about some of these that are just NRSD, and, I, and this is not being negative, I just don't know the answer to this. I don't know if these previously were run past legal counsel that, you know, um, that they were vetted as, as MASCs policies are vetted. I know how much those are. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you see just an NRSD, you kind of wonder what the background was or why it was there. And if, in fact, it was vetted as opposed to the NASCs that you know were vetted. Are you talking about G? Anything in particular in G that you're looking at? You, it was just a general question, wasn't it, Aaliyah? Yeah, it's just a general question about any policy that is only an NRSD policy yeah. that is not I think are there maybe some that are not even grounded in master and law. That That's exactly right. That you're right. All right. If you could identify those and send those forward to me, Leah, so sure. I can talk to Dorothy. Sure. And send those to her. And you're just talking about the sections that we've looked at. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. That would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yes. I just want to make a general comment about that. So MASC has been, um, you know, like looking at policies of <coughs> districts for a long time. And so when they come up with a policy, it's not just that it's MASC. I mean, they've taken into consideration, they've done this for lots and lots of districts. So that that's, I have um, a lot of confidence in, in what MASC comes up with as a policy because not just, I mean, it's been, it's been vetted by them and by lawyers, but also they continually look at districts like ours um, and they've done this with lots of other districts that have been online with all their policies well, for a long time. I thought you were time. asking about NRSD. Are you asking about MASC policies? So no, I, no, I, 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 I Lee's comment, I thought you were saying um, about NRSD policies. Yeah, I think that what Mary is saying is, is getting to is that if it's just an NRSD policy, mm -hmm. might we be out of step with the law? That's yes. exactly well, right. I've been, yeah. I'm okay. asking you to send those forward to me. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, that that was the nature of this work. Yeah. And there was only one that we found that was an outlier that I'll speak to a little bit later. Yeah. But if there are others, Leah, that you found that are just NRSD, again, please send those forward to me and I'll discuss them with Dorothy. So, any other questions or comments about G? Um, Steve? Move to adopt and form section G of the NRSD policy manual, except sections G, D, G, A, A. G, B, G, B, G, B, G, A. G, B, I'm sorry, yep. I can't read my own writing. And G, B, G, A, A, dash R, dash A, D, G. Okay, mm -hmm. can I have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Mary. All in favor? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I have a question. Yes, again. Um, so should we also <coughs> exclude any potential policy that fits into the category we were just discussing? Is it listed on this? So there's form? one, for example, GCA, that says mm -hmm. staff positions. Mm -hmm. It's an NRSD policy, but it's it doesn't have... GCA says staff positions, no changes. Yeah, so this one doesn't have, say, a Mass General Law citation or um, a public law or a court case 
that's driving it. So this is an example um, of a policy that I wonder if MASC has. Um, yeah. I'm looking it up. Please hold, please. Um, so this one is GCA staff positions. Well, well, right well, well, it's saying if you look at the asterisk, it's saying yeah. MASC and the Shoba policies match. So yes. what's, yeah. where's, what's the issue here? I don't know. I That's, so I'm there looking at no file, staff positions. It's filed GCA. I am looking at the recommended, the 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 one that the cleaned up version that was originally adopted in 2001. Um, I would have to check why the source <coughs> MASC slash Neshoba. But if it says no changes, then yeah, I, nice. I think it would be if we have MASC slash Neshoba, it means they could the be two, the same. The two policies. It, it says so it if you look at the asterisk yes. under the note. It says the two policies match. So. Yes. Okay. So should we keep the source um, on the policy? They're then? going to, it, when this is updated, it'll reflect yeah. the source is MASC. And the date okay. will be updated. Okay. All right. So we are approving them in form, and they will be um, the, the 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 citations will be updated. But where it says adopt an MASC policy, that means we did not have a policy. Yeah. And where it says none, it means that the policy was acceptable as is. Right. Okay. So are we ready to vote? We had a second. All in favor of accepting? Opposed? Thank you. All right, now we move to J. Okay, any questions, comments about any of the policies in Section J? Yes. Joseph? Uh, thank you, Madam <coughs> Chair. Um, on the markup <coughs> file, it, it's designated as file JEB, it's titled Entrance Age. And yes. I noticed that the um, red line language states that initial admission of children to the first grade or other grades will involve a consideration of both chronological age and the read readiness of the child to do the work. Um, I was wondering if, if, the, if the superintendent could... Is that something that was crossed out, Joe? If it was, if it's redlined, then it's not. No, it's not. It's not. It's not redlined. It's it's underlined. Okay. So it looks like it's an addition. So hang addition. on one second. Yeah. Hang on. Let me get there. Section with markup for review. So it is J E B entrance age. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Hang on. Um, oh, where is it? Go. On. <laughs> oh. There we go, yeah. right there. Okay. So what I what, see for entrance there? age, this is this is assignment of students to school, J E B entrance age. I'm looking at the, the clean copy that Dorothy sent us for school committee review. That was the one that the policy committee put forward for recommendation. Parents living in the communities of Fulton, Lancaster, and Stowe may register their school age children beginning at the age of five on or before September 1st of the year they are expected to enter kindergarten. Initial admission of children to the first grade will involve consideration of both chronological age and the readiness of children to do the work. Proof of residency required. Okay, that's, so what, the, that's, sorry, that's, that's what being proposed, correct? That's what the policy committee worked on with Dorothy and is putting, it put forward for our, okay. for our consideration. So my question, perhaps best posed to the superintendent would be uh, could you give me an explanation of what that means because I, I can't understand what that particular added language means especially in context of the legal references because I not unless I'm looking at the wrong citation I don't understand how general laws chapter 15 section 1 G or 603 CMR 8 
pertains to determination of readiness for children to do the work when you're looking at an initial admission. So I have no idea. I'd have okay. to take no. I have to take a look back. Uh, I'm just being honest. I'd have to take a look back at at those two uh, sources and and compare them. So so right. I don't have an instant answer for you on that. I I'm not sure what the okay, linkage we'll is. Put that on hold until okay, we get you. the information. Okay. Any other comments or questions about Jay, Mary? So um, J I B. Mm -hmm. Now a nun with no asterisk is is what it says um, it's a student involvement in decision making mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that nun is is a nun with no asterisk the same as a you know I'll, I'll this wasn't done i had to go through it and pull out the this was blank i had okay. to go out through, so i didn't do that whole asterisk thing okay but so if you have a question all right so, to it yep so uh, it says, per MASC, student rep at our school committee meetings meets the requirement for student advisory committee. Mm -hmm. So, and we do have the new book, thank you very much. The one we had before was, uh, of Mass General Law was 2018, this is you know, 2019, so I recycled the other one. Uh, so I, I, I looked it up. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and so, Chapter 71, Section 38M, Student Advisory Committees. Mm -hmm. School committee, I'm going to read it. Mm -hmm. Everybody ready? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll read as quickly as I can. School committees of cities, towns, and regional school districts shall meet at least once every other month during the month school is in session with a student advisory committee to consist of five members to be composed of students elected by the student body of the high school or high schools in each city, town, or regional school district. Mm -hmm. The members of such student advisory committee shall, by majority vote prior to the first day of June in each year, elect from their number a chairperson who shall serve for a term of one year. Said chairperson shall be an ex officio, non voting member of the school <coughs> committee without the right uh, to attend executive sessions unless such right is expressly granted by the individual school committee. Said chairperson uh, shall be subject to all school committee rules and regulations and shall serve without compensation. A school committee may designate a student outreach coordinator for the purpose of ensuring the establishment of a student advisory committee and regularly informing the advisory committee of the school committee's agenda. So um, what, what we have here, um, you know, it, it's just, it doesn't seem to fit, and it, you know, MASC says that the way we do it, mm -hmm. which is the um, the principal mm -hmm. appointing mm -hmm. a person, mm -hmm. takes the place of this. Well, it doesn't sound the it same. Meets, it shouldn't say it takes the place of it. It says it meets the the, the, le, the, the requirement. And well, I also asked um, Brooke if we could look at what other districts do. We we did. We reached and out. We to, reached out. We heard from seven okay. districts who have a member of the student council come every other month. So if it is, uh, as far as the law goes, according to MASC, it is, we are compliant. And um, when I read that, and it's in our policy as required by the law, the committee will meet at least once every other month while school's in session, etc. When you read what the, re the letter of the law with the requirement is, it is, and I'm looking at, at JIB, um, and the essence of it is, as required by state law, the committee will meet at least once every other month while school is in session with its student advisory committee, which is composed of five students elected by the high school student body. <coughs> the chairperson of the student advisory committee shall be an ex officio, non-voting member of the school committee without the right to attend executive sessions unless such right is expressly granted by the school committee. So when I, this is why I, I contacted Dorothy. So it would require the school committee, the school, the high school, to provide us with a student advisory committee composed of five students elected by the high school student body. They would have to meet with this committee would have to meet with that group every other month while school is in session. To me, that is, and this is my opinion, a cumbersome process. And I don't know, looking around the table at people who actually work in schools, their availability during a school day, 
to have a whole, I mean, I don't know what we would gain by following the letter of the law, and it sounds as if there are some school districts who don't even do what we do. Mm -hmm. So when I presented this to Dorothy, and she goes back and she speaks to her colleagues, <coughs> what we do meets the, um, the spirit of this, and I know okay, well, what it says, it's not the letter of the law, but I don't know that we're required to, um, okay. to so, aspire to that. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of school councils, mm -hmm. where uh, in school councils, um, the, the parent representatives are elected by the parent groups. Mm -hmm. The faculty representatives are elected by um, the faculty. Mm -hmm. the, the only people who are appointed basically um, <coughs> are the, um, the community representatives. Mm -hmm. It's not e that easy to get them. And, and as a community representative on school council, it, it's your whole constituency of the town. <coughs> so it sounds as though um, this is something like that in the sense of having a student advisory committee. Now what I understand is that our student our school council at the high school has quite a few students on it, mm -hmm. more so than many other um, uh, um, uh, school councils have. Mm -hmm. But the good part of that could be that somebody from that um, could be considered to be a representative here. What, what occurs to me is that um, we're all about decision making. We're all about student voice. I mean, our our purpose here is to educate students, um, and students are, there are more students, they're, they're our constituents. The only group that's larger than the students is uh, the citizenry of the three towns. Other than that, it's the students, and schools have, some schools have community councils where um, it's representative of how many of each group, so, uh, so students have more seats on a community council. Um, I'm concerned that student voice, this is student involvement in decision making. And what we have right now, and I'm not casting any aspersions toward our, our student representative who gives us the report and then leaves. This says that the student representative would be looking at our agenda ahead of time and bringing that back so that the student advisory group would know what was going on in school committee. Mm -hmm. And if we had someone here um, who would, if we had questions about students or if they had issues, if they were looking at what we're making decisions about and they wanted to give some input, they could give it to their representative. So it seems as though we're not in the spirit of this and we might as well just change it, although I think then we're, we're not going by law and say that what we have is a student representative who is appointed by the principal. And that's what we have. Mm -hmm. And not have any of this other, which I think it makes us, you know, so MASC knows far better than any of us do. Mm -hmm. But to me, so what this is whole proposing? thing, well, that we say so how we do it. And, and I really do believe that there should be, um, see, I'm all about students. And I think everybody around this table is about student voice. And I, it feels as though we're not giving students <coughs> enough of a voice here. Uh, and I think if, if, at least if we have the student representative and an alternative appointed by the principal, perhaps chosen from the, um, the, the school council where there are a whole bunch of students and not as many parents and, um, and teachers, maybe that's the way to do it. This really you know, strikes I, me wrong. I get it. I want to hear from everybody else now. Leah, what are your thoughts? Um, so I, I said this at a previous meeting. I think that the representative to the school committee should be elected and not appointed because ultimately that person should speak for the students. And, I, and even though this is not the case, I believe, mm -hmm. um, I believe that the student who is currently with us is amazing as she is and she probably would be elected. She's not currently truly a representative of the student body. Mm -hmm. Steve? My, f my feeling is that um, considering the three major areas that the school committee is responsible for by law, mm -hmm. um, it would be more relevant for a, school, a student re representative to deal directly with the superintendent and the principal as opposed to the school committee. But that's just my thinking because mm -hmm. 
our responsibilities are very strictly delineated mm -hmm. by Massachusetts law. Mm -hmm. Mike? Um, yeah, I think Mary brings a good point to the table that uh, there are some pretty stark contrasts between what we have in place and what MASC um, suggests. Um, I, I guess I guess I don't I got you know this being the first time I've heard of this. I guess I would hold off on opining about this until I educated myself more uh, on whether. <coughs> what we have in place is appropriate or what we have in place is a misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just, at this point, I just don't, I don't know. Just? Um, I, I couldn't agree more with what my colleague from Stowe said about, you know, the limited areas of our jurisdiction here. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree more with you that I think that, that what the, I think the statute requires is cumbersome and time-consuming. And I, I, I respect what my colleague from Bolton is saying about, you know, and my other colleague from Stowe about student input, but um, I, I, I agree with the chair. I think it's, it's time consuming and it's going to be cumbersome to do this. That being said, I do agree with my colleague from Bolton that what the statute says is what the statute says. Mm -hmm. So I'm, and, and you indicated that you believe that we are in compliance. Well, I, I asked MASC because I brought it up when I read the policy, just because I know what we do, I know what that says, but I also look at, as I pointed out, the practicality of that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, so I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Okay. And, and let me just say this. I, I'd be curious to what MASC says, because mm -hmm. I will be frank with, with all of my members here. I am not an adherent to what you know, the, because MSC dictates it, doesn't necessarily make it so. Mm -hmm. And I look at the statute, and I, I'm wondering to myself, how many of the school committees throughout the Commonwealth are doing this? I, I don't know of any. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know of any, and I don't know how many are in compliance with. I mean, does this particular statute serve a purpose? Obviously, the legislature thought it did at one time. I'm, I'm just curious as to you know what are other districts doing, and mm -hmm. how are they addressing this? Because frankly, Madam Chairman, I couldn't agree with you more. And I know that's not going to sound going to resonate very popular with, with some of the students and maybe some of their parents. But again, I agree with what Steve says. We have a limited area of, of, of jurisdiction. We have a limited area of, of authority. And I'll be frank, I don't want to sit here every other Wednesday and listen to gripes and things that are outside of our, 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 our control. So I'd just be very interested to know where other school districts stand with something like this. OK. Mike? Um, as we're kind of talking about this and you know things are coming in a little bit more focus, I wonder whether it's relevant or not that our um, student rep is a essentially a high school student rep, <coughs> and ought, ought the representative be a representative of, of all students if that's even possible, or should it just be a high school rep since that's our flagship school? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think we would have to look in. I don't, I don't know if it says in the, the general laws, Joe, if you're looking at that. But it does. It does. Mm -hmm. High school. My, uh, I'm sorry, Mary. So uh, usually it is a high school student, and, and um, I think it's been very interesting that, that our representative, our high school uh, representative, has talked about the other schools. That's not been my experience in the past. Um, usually the high school representative talks about what's going on in the high school. But I read this a little differently that the committee will meet at least once every month while school is in session. I read that to mean September through June, not during the school day. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't you say? Uh, that's my, well, that's I, my interpretation. No, I don't, uh, well, mm -hmm. so I, I think it's, it, it's not summertime where we, we continue to have some meetings, um, but it, that it would be September um, through June. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it would be worthwhile. It, it's in here. It's in Mass General Law that that's what we're supposed to do. So, yeah. um, Leah, I would say that it would fall more into the spirit of the law if that representative were elected. Mm -hmm. Had she <coughs> and her alternate been elected, I think that we would be closer to the spirit of the law. Probably not letter of the law. Mm -hmm. Well, excuse me. Thing, well, I would like to say something. Okay. What I would like to say is that when I read this. For us, what it would mean is uh, another meeting every other month with this group.
group from the high school, which the high school would have to promote as and have a whole school election to select five students to be part of this council. And I am all for kids. It's been my life, my life's work. And I, I don't want to set up a false expectation for kids that they can tell us stuff that we might not be able to act on. And, and I'm also thinking about, about time. Everyone's time here. We're committed to these meetings. I mean, we made a big um, effort to make sure that as many meetings as we knew we were going to have this year, we, we knew about so we could plan ahead. Um, I, am, I, I think that if, if folks want to explore it more, it has to involve um, a discussion with, with somebody from the high school. Mm. I do want to talk to MASC to see what other schools are doing. Mm. But I think that, you know, Ibi does not, uh, she comes and she reports on things that are going on throughout the district. And as long as I've been on the, the school committee, that's what the, the, the student rep has done, and, and it has been, been great. I, I worry about even on school council, and it's wonderful that there are kids on the school council, but how do we know they really represent what the student body is thinking? How do, we, how do they get that information? How do they, what, what do they put out to bring information in? And, and that's my concern. I, I think it's in, in, in spirit, it's a great idea. I want to know what, what kids think. But when you set up a, a system and have someone come to re represent everybody, what system is set up for them to get that information to present to us? So that's why I see it as, as cumbersome. If it's not during the school day while school is in session and it's outside of the school day, that's a whole other set of meetings for us because it says the school committee. So. Um, yes, Mary. So uh, to go along, there, there probably is a way to be more in the spirit of this. If someone, and maybe maybe the other, the alternative could alternative representative alternative. could um, could be um, elected, but there needs to be some way for, and this is the other side of what you were just saying, for the students to go back to some constituency, maybe it's student council, somebody to say, this is what school committee is doing. Otherwise. The student representative is just for our benefit. Here, here's what's going on. Every single one of the schools in our district have newsletters that if we want to take the time, we can read all the things that are going on in, in, um, in the news. So while, while that's nice, what happens, it doesn't seem to me that students are learning more about school committee and what we're doing, and that would be the other part of it, that she or he or they would have a constituency to go back to and say, this is what's on school committee, this is the agenda. So, so I don't see necessarily, mm -hmm. I think what, I don't see them necessarily, the five people <coughs> meeting with us. I think there's a way to do this with the student representatives, and I totally agree with you that we need, um, you know, the principal of the high school here to talk but about this. But it's not for us to dictate to this. This is the, the because we, we make policy. We this is, do this make is a, policy. This is exactly, exactly what we do. This, right. is, this is our province policy. we don't policy. dictate to the, the principal. No, but we make the policy. Right. And then the procedures are carried out by administration. Right. But I would want to know where the interest is at the high school with, with students wanting to be involved in this. That, because we're making assumptions about what kids, about, it's just another layer of, of something. Now, I want to get more information from Dorothy. We can hold it out as we've held out a couple of other things and okay. come back and revisit it. Let's do that. Um, but the, if we follow the letter of the law, then it, it creates a whole other set of meetings and expectations for the high school, et cetera. If we begin to tweak it um, as a policy, who's not to say that there's, we don't continue with, with what we're doing? Or there might be, an, if there's a vehicle already set up within the high school to represent the students, the student council, why not take advantage of that? Might be the way. So I just don't want, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, I know it, it, the importance of the student voice and there's work being done at the high school to get at that. Mm -hmm. 
that might be a conduit for us. Okay. I just want to say it's here. It's in this. I know okay. that. All right. That's mass general <laughs> it's law. It's in there too. Okay. Steve. I just want to, I just want to comment that following up on what I said before about the three areas of responsibility that we have, which are of vital interest to the parents, which is and the citizens of the towns that we represent. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I'm none of the business of the <coughs> students. Mm -hmm. They are not involved. I mean, you, you want to take back our agenda. They are not involved in hiring the superintendent or even interested in who the superintendent is or the evaluation of the superintendent. Maybe on a periphery, they might be interested in our policies. But, and the number three, which is the budget. Mm -hmm. They have absolutely no say in the budget. They have absolutely no interaction whatsoever with the budget. I don't want to hear that the fish served last Friday was dry or that the history teacher didn't do this. I think we're trying to carry the letter of the law much too much and the idea of, oh, they should have the agendas so they can go back and, you know, talk to their student council or their This is This is not a high school student's job or his responsibility or even his area of concern. It's the area of concern of our constituents who are our voters, the other set of constituents who are the parents who are also voters, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and the administration headed by the superintendent. And I, I think that, that in terms of the student voice, I know that in the process of hiring a superintendent, there were no students on the hiring committee, but there were surveys that went out. I don't know what the, the, the input from students were, but they went to parents, they went to community members. But I think this warrants further discussion, further clarification from um, MASC, and unless there's anything new that someone wants to add, mm -hmm. um, yes, Mary. The name of this is student involvement in decision making. One question is, do we have to have this policy at all? Because it doesn't, you know, I, I would like to have this and I would like to be more in keeping um, with the literal as well as the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. um, but student, and I would like students to be involved in decision making, but is it necessary? Um, there's such disparity between practice and what they're mm -hmm. saying here that we need some guidance. Okay, yeah, I would agree. Any last words on this before? I close the discussion on JID. So moving forward, I am going to be in touch with NASC for clarification about the law versus <coughs> practice. Um, what do, are other districts doing? I know that Alita was able to hear from seven, and what they do is have um, someone come and report from the student council every other month. Um, and it'd be good to know what other districts do. Um, I, I'd yes. like to point out too, though, that we heard from seven out of over 300 districts. So I just want to put that out there. So I, I would be caught. I guess I'm just saying, I'd be cautious about taking what the, those, even those seven did. I honestly, I really, and you know, I don't like to get involved in this because policy is really your domain. It's really not the superintendent's domain. But I think we need to do what's right for Neshoba, whatever, whatever that is. And sometimes it's not always in agreement with MASC. There are going to be times where it's going to be okay for you to say, "This is not, this is not our area. This this doesn't feel good to us. It doesn't feel comfortable." Mm -hmm. I also agree with Mary in in the, the from the lens that because we we've dealt with this as administrative team, we only put we only put forward what we know is true and authentic to the work that we're doing. If it's not we're not put, we're not articulating it. We're not putting it up there. So I would also agree that if we're not doing it, and this is not where we're going to go, it shouldn't be in policy. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate and respect the fact that you brought that up. Mm -hmm. I also want to go back to exactly. I think Steve makes a really <coughs> valuable point to always consider when you're thinking about student voice and school committee because your role is really around those three things. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's a fifty-five million dollar plus budget. Mm -hmm. I don't know what students could bring to that, you know. 
Um, really, I, 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 I worry about opening that Pandora's box just a, just a tad because they have voice at other places. And you hear, you know, even with Paul, with, I, with doing what he's trying to do with the engagement, only 10 kids coming, you know, and it's not like they're not pushing it out there. They are, you know, like, I just want to be cautious that whatever we do, mm -hmm. we're setting ourselves and the district up for success, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. Other qua questions or comments? Let me collect some more information. We'll come back and we will revisit it. Um, I don't think anyone, I think we have demonstrated as a committee our interest in hearing from students through their presentations, through their communications with us and what bubbles up from the schools. And I think it's important to note that in all of our schools, elementary, middle, and high schools, there is a vehicle for students to be involved in de decision making and to be heard as individuals. And I think that that's really important, but we need to figure out where this works for us just as, yeah. as uh, Brooke was saying. Thank okay, you. so Madam Chair, can I also make a suggestion here? Looking at the time, it's I know it's already past 8.30, mm -hmm. and I know we've had an executive session mm -hmm. planned as well that we were planning on probably taking at least 20 minutes to half an hour. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we should table some or any of this okay. in light of the time, because we really need to be kind of on top of your game for the executive session. So. Do, you want, do you want to have them, do you want to adapt, adopt Jay with those? With the exception well, of those two sections? What I'd like to, um, <coughs> what I would like to suggest we do is we've adopted G with, I think we've pulled one thing out. I think that I don't want to rush through this because there are some other well, things, there are two that things on it. I needed to discuss. Um, but I think they can wait. We're ahead of our schedule with, in terms of adoption. I had thought that this would be done at the end of December. So we do have some time. Um, I think we put it on the agenda to come back and look at, finish looking at Jay. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of things that were outliers from last time that there's no urgency to discuss. So I think that um, if we could put um, a policy section J under um, Alita for the 20th mm -hmm. and under old business, please keep policy DED slash DFG and CM, mm -hmm. and then we can go to the business manager report. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that she okay can probably, everybody? Uh, Pat can probably talk pretty quickly. Do we need a motion for that? I beg your pardon? Do we need a motion to table? Because I'll, I'll be happy to make a motion to table. Uh, we've, we've, we've never made motions to table. Before. Really? But, yeah, no, they never do. Yeah. It's, you guys. And you know what, Joe? We don't have a policy like about it either. We've, we've tried, but it's, it's failed it's like every time. It's away from being on a committee if you don't have to table stuff. OK. Pat, you want to come in? Uh, you can be quick with this, Pat. Yeah, I'm yes, pretty sure we can talk this through quickly. Yeah. So we've tabled all the policy, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the okay. policy is tabled now. Before Pat speaks, can I say something? You may. Okay. Thank you. I know that this is tedious work for, for all of us sitting around here, and I'm sure the viewers at home and our, our press people. I I know this is tedious work. But I, I also want to stress that it's <laughs> critically important to work to a school district, just like a, a, a Bible to a church that lays that foundational document. That's how I see our policy handbook. It is a foundation for us. It's the thing that we always go back to. It's the thing we always refer to. It's critical, but we have to get it right, and we have to make sure it ties in with a, a appropriate case law and current case law and all that. I know this is... I know that's a hassle going through, but I am so grateful for the work that you're doing and the amount of engagement, so thank you very much for that. No, and I also want to add, I know we went on a kind, kind of long about the, the field trips and et cetera, but that's it, the, <coughs> what they were talking about in terms of the, the global competency and the field trips and how they all fit in, those are conversations we've never had around the table before, and they're important because they speak to the educational experiences that we're providing for kids. Mm -hmm. And so um, if, if, if there's a point at which um, you know, people feel it's going too long or you know, if there's feedback you want to give me about the way I handle the um, discussions, et cetera, 
I'm very, very open to it. Not now, because we don't have time. <laughs> but you can speak to me individually. You can send me an email. But I, I, I welcome the discourse. I'm glad that people are engaged, as Brooke says, and, and have questions and are interested. And I think when you're dealing with, I mean, you know, we, we, we have to do budget, superintendent, and policy. <coughs> but to understand the things that this district provides for kids is of the utmost importance. And, and I think that that's a real strength of this committee that we give folks the time to fill us in on that stuff. So hi, Pat. Hello. <laughs> now it's some real fun stuff. We get to know what we're doing with our money. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have the treasurer's report up first. Um, this would be for the month of September. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that we have a lot of money in there. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it goes down as fast as it comes yeah. down. It comes down. <laughs> it looks great. Right. It always looks good just for yeah. more Yeah, but time. everything, we're in fine financial condition in regards to that. I want to bring up the um, results of operation. Um, as far as results for operations, this is very early in the school year. Um, most of our spending... Um, <coughs> has not even taken place and um, everything, um, you can see the projected expenditures is pretty high at this point, which is to be understood, typical, typical. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything in particular? Well, the only oh, Steve, I'm sorry. The, the only question I would have is, is I mean, just so early in the, in the year we're looking at a Almost sixty thousand dollar deficit mm -hmm. for Mary Rowlandson. Is that caused by a specific thing? Yes, that was staffing yeah. um, based on enrollment. Based on enrollment okay. numbers, we had, we had to add some additional staff. We had no choice on that. And that ha that, as you know, Steve, that happens always in September when the numbers come in and you've got move-ins or whatever, and then you've got you have to relook at your uh, okay. staffing. That's all. That's, it is. that's really the only significant thing I'm looking at. Right now. Yeah. Is anybody else in here? Yeah, I, I, I just want to follow up on the superintendent's remarks. I know you've mentioned this in the past. Could you just speak a little bit more about what we're seeing in Lancaster? Because just from a visceral standpoint, I'm seeing a lot of out-of-state license plates in the parking lot <laughs> at Mary Rowlandson. So it does look like we're seeing a real spike in... Yes. In, okay. You're, no, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. But I, but I would tell you that across, it's, it's interesting you bring this point up because we just had this conversation in the administrative team the other day because it's not just Mary Rowlandson, like you're seeing it there, of course that, that's your school, right, you know? Right. But we are seeing that across the district, and you're absolutely right, out of district license plates. Um, we're also seeing a, a large in, um, spike with um, special education needs as well. I would say that that's, it won't surprise me that we don't um, see a definite increase in our costs in that area too, because a lot of, a lot of what we're seeing is New, some a lot of new movements are coming in with some additional issues. That's not being judgmental or anything. I'm just saying, you you're going to see that on this sheet of paper in, in both the next two months or three months. What what do you? I'm sorry, may I interrupt? Yeah. yeah. What 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 are we seeing as far as numbers are concerned? How, do you have any rough figures on those? Um, for, for, no, he's <coughs> no, he's not talking your kind of numbers. No, he's talking numbers of students, yeah. physical numbers of students, right? Um, no, I, actually, that, that's something we generally report on after the October 1st count go, is submitted, which is submitted, to be honest with you, the final numbers aren't until November 1st. We generally come in after that and say, here are the numbers. And so you'll, you'll see it. We'll, we'll do an actual report out okay, on that. But, but I do think, uh, if, if I could just make a quick comment, what you're, I don't suspect that you're going to see those of you who were sitting around this table last year. Some of the, the huge spikes in, in numbers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Mary Rowlandson is was probably the only outlier this year where we had that happen. But I do think that you'll see, um, just because I know the, the cases that we've we've been involved in, I do think you'll see some additional sp special education costs. But and we're waiting to see. Um, of course, with the, the facilities, you may still see some additional costs incurred there that are not anticipated. And again, part of it's just the high school or the buildings themselves and the ages. So, but I, I don't think that, and, and, and the flip side is that, that is you won't see a big amount of money that comes in, for example, like we had last year with our insurance that ultimately, you know, helped bring forward a, a surplus for us this year that we didn't count on. We're not expecting that this year at all. 
So I think this year you're going to see your numbers are going to stick a little bit closer to what we anticipated in case we have some unanticipated costs. Mm -hmm. Steve? Two things. Um, these out-of-state license plates we're seeing, I assume we're doing our due diligence. And oh, yes. For residency? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And the no, they're all they're all legitimate. Uh, uh, they're just really. moving. They're moving in, and they haven't changed their license plates yeah, yet. Yeah, that's all it is. But they're they're moving the here to stay. Have police notify them. They've got thirty <laughs> days. <laughs> or, or, or we or we uh, good, good well, luck put up put a uh, put a lock on their their cars because that's the law. Thirty days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other the, the other thing I would like to uh, ask is uh, since I wasn't here for the last two meetings. The vehicle, we did get the yes. new vehicle. Thank you. That's it's right in the back parking lot here. Outstanding. It, it, what's it? The truck with the bucket lift on it? I no, saw no, it. no, that no. was National Grid. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, re I realize that. I realize that. No, it's parked right up against the building. Good. Okay. Okay. And no further questions. Okay. okay. And timeline. The timeline. Um, this is something that um, Alita has just put up. I'll just pass this out both ways. So we have, I don't know if you're looking at the screen or whatever. <laughs> um, the top half of this um, report, um, based on this timeline, is what we've been working off in the district. And we, I created this back in August. and to um, to let the administrators know um, pretty early on what their timeline was going to be like this year for our budget. Now the bottom part, I sort of filled in report outs as I thought they were going to happen. Well, as you can see in the month of October, there are a couple of things that haven't happened. You know, I haven't brought them forward to you yet, but um, <clears throat> that's because I haven't had the opportunity. At the bottom? Uh, yeah, the bottom part. If, if anything needs to change, I think that's an opportunity for yeah. you to decide when you want to have that information based on what is above that because this is how I'm, I'm getting the information from the administrator. But Tom has been in to speak about food services already and um, I know the early education, we've, we've put that right. off very deliberately. So I, I'm not concerned about those okay. those things. I, I did say to Pat though today, and you know, I just I put this out as a general <coughs> caution for us. Um, especially, especially, I know tonight needed to happen for the policy the way that it did, and I'm very respectful of that. But your next couple of meetings are packed, <laughs> packed, and I, I I worry about the amount of time that you're going to be spending. Or we're going to have to start bumping up additional meetings mm -hmm. because there, there's just uh, and we're a missing lot a meeting. We're missing the, the, the November, November 6th. Yeah. which we normally do anyway, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. That's a norm for us. So I, I just want to put it on your radar that these are going to be packed meetings coming up. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Anything that's, else? That's it. Okay. okay. Oh, I'd like to just um, say that one of our goals um, for the year, the school committee goals, is. To, for the committee, especially the new members, uh, to be in service relative to the way that the budget planning works. I know this lays out a timeline, and um, it might be something that the, the budget and warrant committee could take up in terms of what else we need to know as we're working through the budget. If you're new to this process, what is it you need to know? And then come forward with recommendations to Pat and if we have to have a workshop um, an hour before a meeting, then so be it. We will, but I, it, but it's, it, I think it's premature at this point to, to do I, that. But I, I, what I'm suggesting is that on um, budget and warrant, you have two new members mm -hmm. of the committee, not just a budget and warrant. But as, as people that are new to the committee, what, what help, what understandings do they have to have as we work through this timeline? So it might be a meeting to have where you talk about those things okay. and uh, come up with some uh, suggestions for Pat on how to help people better understand the budget. Okay. So, yes. So we're not going to meet. Um, no, I, no how, how, about, how about 11.20? November 20th. Okay. 5 o'clock. Okay. I'll send out the information. Okay. okay. So I was just looking. This is very helpful. To, did you recognize that I could speak? 
Did you? No, no I didn't. but I'm standing with <laughs> Mary, so just, you know, <laughs> no, you get no, that one right by me. No, I thought you were going I might have, yeah. I thought you, might have, yeah. Um, I thought yeah. you gave me a nod. Yeah. Um, because I did. We, we weren't, oh good, because we weren't going to meet um, Stephen. We weren't Until meet after the first. After, first, so that wouldn't, yeah. that wouldn't fit. No, but um, we, will, we, will, we will meet for the first time on the 20th okay. of November. All right, and, and I just wanted to say that this is very um, useful, thank you. And it does say that there's a budget workshop on the yes. 25th. Yes, yeah. so that's a Saturday. That's Saturday. Okay. We go through every line item and the yeah. different departments come and make presentations to us. Oh, that's what that is. But okay. what would be good to get a sense yes. of is for those folks okay. who are new to the process, what would be helpful in helping you understand it? Okay. I mean, I've been on this committee for five years, six budgets, mm -hmm. whatever. And before that, I had familiarity from whatever else I did. Um, so I can't presume to know what people need to know okay. or don't know. All right, and so just one other yes, comment. Um, Joe, the way we have to have the ad hoc not on the 20th. That's why I didn't put the agenda forward for the ad hoc committee. Um, we were gonna have a meeting on the 20th, but um, we'll, we'll, def we'll defer. Yeah. yeah. All right. Can go so to December. Okay. All right. That's all. Okay. Leah, could you just quickly clarify, Pat, sure. what it means by school lunch rates? Well, if um, I, I think that was, I think Tom mentioned that at this point, um, if there were going to be any increases in school lunch rates, we would have announced them <coughs> at that point. That kids would pay. Anything? Yes, if we had anticipated anything in that in the next budget process. Okay. Steve. Yep. Be ready to. Well, I, yes. I, I just just as a future agenda item, I would like to talk about or have the principal, uh, the superintendent, talk to us about school start times, especially based on, okay. on the fact of California's new law. All right. Let me. We that is on that's our on, and that's oh, our parking, parking, lot parking lot to yeah. discuss to that. Discuss might, I don't think you were at that meeting, okay. but it's in the. If you look at the planning calendar, it is one of the things. Okay. I and some of the things that, that are on the planning calendar for future agenda items. Our priority is the budget until. We, we know that we're in the ballpark of getting it. So if you're, the things that you want to talk about don't get on an agenda, it doesn't mean they'll never get on an agenda, but we have the budget as our priority, and you'll understand why as we really get into it. So, okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Okay. Um, there are no subcommittee reports. <coughs> there is no correspondence of note. Uh, the consent agenda. We have a motion to accept the consent agenda, Steve. I guess so. We, okay. Uh, there's a, I'm, I move to approve the consent agenda of October 23rd, containing the meeting min minutes of October 9th, 2019, and warrants of October 25th, 2019. Second. 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 You can take that. Thank you, Mary. Give it to Joe. All Thank in you. favor? Thank you. Opposed? Okay, items to be considered for future agendas. Steve's item is already on a future agenda. Thank you. Any other items for future agendas? Mike? Um, I'd like to propose having a discussion about um, the school committee's policy on <coughs> responding to residents' correspondences. Okay. Um, uh, We're not going to discuss it. If that's anything else about the topic, just, that's just, the topic. Just, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. Okay, no, but that's the topic. School committee's response to constituents' emails. Correct. And I, and I guess I would I would add that as a member of the personnel subcommittee, mm -hmm. I wonder if that the notes from that kind of discussion could be embedded into the school committee um, uh, manual. Well, that's what we would discuss. So to put in the parking lot, Alita. I got it. Okay, great. School committee discussion on school committee policies in response to constituents. In communicate responding to constituents. Responding to yes. constituents. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does that capture it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then people can make suggestions for what they want in the menu. Mm -hmm. Okay. Steve. Okay. I move to go into executive session at eight fifty, pursuant to Massachusetts General Law C thirty A section twenty one A two to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, Unit A contract negotiations, 
to include <coughs> Superintendent Clenchy, Assistant Superintendent Dr. McGuire, and Director of Human Resources, and Marie Stoica. The committee will, return, will adjourn in executive session. Can I have a second, please? Second. Okay. Can Welcome. you call the roll? <coughs> Dr. Mag Dr. McCarthy? Yes. Mike Horst? Here. Steve Rubenstein? Here. Uh, yes. <laughs> Leah Vertorito? Yes. Kathy Fodian? Yes. Joseph, please. Yes. <coughs> Okay, good night everyone, thank you. you. <laughs>